Death in the Casino. Target Practice Mysteries 5. Written by Nikki Haverstock. Narrated by the author. Chapter 1. Moo, my Great Dane buddy, and I pressed our noses to the window of the Westmount Center for Competitive Shooting Sports van as we flew down the freeway past the glittering casinos of Las Vegas. I imagined how they would sparkle at night. Just a few more exits to the casino, Jess called over her shoulder as she maneuvered to the right lane. Jess, a friend from college who is now my boss at the Westmount Training Center for Competitive Shooting Sports, was driving the center's van to our first travel tournament of the year. Next to me was my roommate and co-worker, Mary. Moo was on my other side. Tiger and Minx, two of the on-site athletes from the center, had also hitched a ride from Wyoming to the casino just off the Vegas Strip, where the tournament was being held. Suddenly, the van was filled with the sound of chirps and beeps as several phones, including mine, alerted to a message. I pulled out my phone as Mary and Minx did the same. I had a message from Login, an archer that worked for the same parent company as us, that read, Hurry! Someone is trying to kill me! Minx leaned her head over the back of the seat between Mary and me. Kill him? What's that knucklehead going on about? Mary looked up from her phone. Why don't you call him and see? Minx sat down and punched a few buttons before talking into the phone. Tiger turned around in the front seat as our van turned down a wide road. Another mystery, eh? We can't take you two anywhere. I snickered at him as he turned back to his phone, where it looked like he was texting someone. Don't be so dramatic, said Minx. She looked at me and rolled her eyes. We'll be there in a few minutes. I can see the casino now. Bye. I turned back to the front of the van as we went through an intersection and approached a large casino. It was several miles from the Vegas Strip, which meant there was ample parking. A parking garage was off to one side, but Jess pulled into the open parking area in front of the casino. On the electronic marquee beneath the name of the casino flashed the name of the tournament, the Casino Cup. Casino Cup? I turned to Mary. I didn't know this tournament actually had a name. You've just been calling it the Vegas Tournament. Mary unbuckled and reached to slide the door open. This is the first year it's been called that. There are tons of new changes. Bigger prize money, sanctioned betting on the tournament, and the new name. She leaped from the car, twisted, and stretched. Moo was two steps behind her. I grabbed his leash as it snaked out and was dragged out of the van. Once he hit the ground, he raised his nose to sniff the air, and I was able to catch my balance. Holding tightly to his leash, I reached back into the van to grab my messenger bag. The air was still cool, but much warmer than the Wyoming winter we had escaped. We had left a day earlier, with an overnight stop in Utah on the way down. I was almost as thrilled as Moo to be out of the car. I stretched down to touch my toes, then fidgeted to get rid of the stitch in my side from Moo pushing up against me for hundreds of miles. Jess popped out of the back of the van. Mary grabbed the bow case that we were sharing and passed me my rolling bag. Once the van was locked up, we headed toward the casino. Minx's phone rang. Hello? Yeah. She spun in a circle. Where? Okay, bye. She raised her voice to call out to us as we continued toward the entrance. Jess, can you check in without us? Mary Dye and I have to go meet Logan. Sure. Jess and Tiger continued walking. Where is he? I looked around the parking lot, trying to spot Logan's tall, athletic build, but except for us, the parking lot appeared empty of anyone standing around. As I spun in a circle, a dark blue truck flashed its lights. Minx was facing the opposite direction. He said he's in a truck? I grabbed my bag. Then I know where he is. Moo raced ahead, darting one way then the other as I moved toward the truck. Logan rolled down the window and peered around. Are you alone? Minx crossed her arms. Do you see anyone else out here? Why do you think someone is trying to kill you? 
I don't think I know. After a few months around these two, he pointed at Mary and me, I think I know when violence is about to happen. He had a good point. Fair enough, I said. Can we go over to that grass? Moo's been stuck in the car for a while. He exited the truck and gave each of us a quick hug. I'm glad you guys are here. Finally, people I can trust. Aw, Logan, that is so sweet of you. I followed him to the back of his truck where he pulled out a bag and a bow case. I thought you'd been here a few days. Why aren't your things in your room? We fell into stride with him and I walked double time to keep up with his long strides. You know, I won this tournament last year and I feel even more confident this year. The payout is way up this year. 100000 for the men's pro division. I really want to win. I still have debts from last year. Even with the job at Anderson Archery? I followed Moo onto the patch of grass while Logan, Mary, and Minks huddled on the sidewalk. I've only been there about a month. I'll eventually pay everything off, but a win will be a big load off my shoulders financially. Plus, I want to win. Twice as many guys are in our division as last year, the best from all over the world. I nodded along. Archers, like most athletes, were competitive by nature. This doesn't explain why you think you're in danger. Right. Last night, a group of about 20 of us went out to eat on the strip. They ordered a round of shots, but I passed. I never drink on a competition weekend. The two buddies I was sharing a room with started to feel sick, so we left. We had parked on the other side of the street. When we started to cross, this van tried to run us down. I turned my back on Moo so he could do his business. It's a big city. People drive like jerks all the time. It wasn't an accident. I saw that van come to a complete stop, then go. The license plates were gone as well. But that's not the entire story. I hear that about an hour later, another group of guys left, and one of them got hit by a white van on the same corner. He's in critical condition. I sucked in air through my teeth. That's pretty dang suspicious. And it gets worse. My two roommates were still feeling awful this morning, so I drove them over to the clinic. The doctor there thought that someone might have slipped something into their drinks. That was the final straw. They packed up and left the second they got back to the casino. I turned to Mary and raised my eyebrows. She pursed her lips and nodded back. Did you, your roommates, and the guy that was hit with the van have anything in common? We're all shooting in the same division, the men's pro division. Clearly a competitor is trying to take us out. He looked around furtively. I figure that you can protect me. You can be my angels, like Charlie's angels. I chuckled. Logan's angels. You know that we're always up for an adventure. So your roommates bailed? Is that why you were hiding in your car with your luggage? I cleaned up Moo's mess and threw it in a trash can. He nodded. I can't afford to put the entire room on my credit card. I'm hoping to find someone I trust to share a room with. My phone buzzed in my pocket, and a smile broke across my face when I saw the call was from Liam. I stepped away to answer. Hello? Liam's muffled voice came through. Hey, Orion Mom and I just landed. You there yet? The heavy engine noise of the Westmount Company jet roared in the background. We just got here. Jess is checking us in. Can she check us in as well? But only if it's convenient. I took a few steps away and lowered my voice. Sure, I'll run in and ask her in a second. But first, what kind of room do you and Orion have? Logan's in a bind for a place to sleep after his roommates quit the tournament. Uh, hold on. His deep, rumbly voice was muffled before returning. Tell him if he wants to dog sit Moo on Saturday evening when we take you and Mary out to dinner, then he's welcome to have the fold-out couch in our room. You guys are so nice. Only for you. We'll be there within the hour. I'll wait for you. Bye. After I hung up, I took a few seconds to try and wipe the smile off my face, but failed. I gave up and turned back to the group. Mary looked at me and laughed. Let me guess, Liam's here? Yes, Miss Smarty Pants. They should be here any minute. And I have a possible solution for Logan if he wants. But
but we need to go inside so I can pass a message on to Jess. Come on. I grabbed my luggage in one hand and pulled Moo in close with the other as Logan joined me on the sidewalk. What's the solution? If you want, and are willing to walk and watch Moo on Saturday evening, you can crash on the couch that pulls out into a bed in Liam and Orion's room. Seriously? That'd be awesome. You're saving me already, princess. He tapped the automatic door button at the front of the casino. Minx giggled behind me. I love that my nickname for Die is catching on. I rolled my eyes but continued to the check-in line. Nothing had been able to dissuade Minx from the nickname I hated, so I did my best to ignore it. We all made it through the doors and halted to let our eyes adjust. The line to the front desk snaked back and forth through velvet ropes. The clanks of the slot machine filled the air. The doors were tinted and no windows meant that the interior was insulated from any sense of time. It was like stepping into an alternate world. Moo danced and pranced at the end of his leash. He lifted his nose in the air. His head jerked in all directions as buzzers, bells, and machines flashed and chimed. We're not in Wyoming anymore, Moo. I pulled him close and patted his ribs. Can you guys watch my luggage while I talk to Jess? I shed my jacket and threw it over my bag before walking over to Jess as she approached the desk. Good, you're here. I'm pretty sure they will want to see Moo. She pulled out a credit card. Liam called. Can you check them in as well? Sure. She gave the gentleman Liam's mother's name, Elizabeth Anderson, too. He dutifully nodded. He rapidly typed in his screen and started pulling out room keys. As he did, I realized that on the front of the room keys were pictures of archers holding their bow. I turned around. There were banners with pictures of archers and the words Casino Cup hanging from the ceiling. Wow, I had no idea that the entire casino was going all out for the tournament, or that they'd allow Moo to come. The gentleman leaned over the counter slightly, then ducked down to pull out an additional bag. We're thrilled to have both the tournament and your dog here for this weekend. These are additional supplies for your canine companion, including a map to all of our pet facilities. Should you have an accident... There's a number you can call, and we'll handle the situation immediately. I rubbed behind Moo's head as he rested his chin on the counter to assess the man that was talking. You're not concerned about his size? Not at all, ma'am. We often have horse shows in the arena. But I bet the horses don't stay in the rooms. He winked at me. You never know. I have marked down that he is a pet. Is that correct? As opposed to a service dog, I mean. Yes, that's correct. Then I would like to let you know that while he is a welcome guest in our facility, much like children, he will need to stay on the dark red pathway as opposed to the gambling area. He is not allowed in our dining rooms either, but they will deliver to your room if you would like. No gambling for me this weekend. Thank you. He had just passed over the keys to Jess when Moo barked and jerked on the leash. I turned and there was Liam a dozen feet away. Liam! I chirped, but it got caught in my throat as I launched myself into his arms. He picked me up and squeezed me to his chest. His lips grazed my cheek before settling onto the curve of my neck. He put me back on the ground but didn't let go. I've missed you so much, he breathed into my ear. Moo wedged his nose between our legs. He pushed until he was completely between us, his tail whacking me as he wagged it. Liam chuckled and let go of me. Hey, Moo, I've missed you, too. He kneeled down and scratched Moo behind the ears. Moo lifted his head and let out a deep howl of pleasure. Woo! We walked over to a collection of couches set up between the casino floor and the check-in desk. There was a half wall around the seating to block out some of the noise from the slot machines. Mary, Minx, Jess, Tiger, and Logan were already there and had been joined by Orion and Elizabeth. Elizabeth extended her arms to me. So good to see you, Di. I brought you something. After we hugged, she handed Mary and me each a bag with the Clear Optics logo. You both did such a great job evaluating the companies at the OIT show that I thought you earned these. Last month at the Outdoor Industry Trade Show, Mary and I had gone around to two optics companies to give our opinion. We were unsure of what was expected, but we did our best then told Liam and Orion what we thought. 
After the show, we typed up our thoughts and sent them over to Elizabeth's executive assistant so they would have a copy. Opening the bag, I pulled out a set of high-end binoculars that I recognized from the show. I tore open the packaging and took a moment to stroke them lovingly. I felt the heft in my hand and noticed the immaculate design meld into my grip. Noticing the suggested retail price only heightened my appreciation of the gift. I removed the lens cap and swooned over the crystal clear image of the far side of the casino. Elizabeth, this is too much. Hush, Di. Mary pulled out her binoculars and also looked to where the far end of the casino disappeared out of sight. If Elizabeth wants to give us a gift, then it is rude not to take it. Check that out. I can read today's special on the sign outside of the Italian restaurant. Elizabeth chuckled. Listen to Mary. She's smart. I carefully put the cap back on the binoculars to protect the glass while a swell of appreciation and contentment rolled over me. I gave her a smile. Thank you, Elizabeth. Mary stepped away to show the binoculars off while everyone exchanged greetings and chatted. You're welcome. Elizabeth pulled me to the side. I've been very impressed with the contributions you've made since we hired you. Do you like working at the training center? I love it, and I really enjoy the extra projects I've been able to work on, like the training blogs and the research we did at the OIT show. Good. If other projects come up, would you like to have an opportunity to work on them? I couldn't imagine what type of projects these could be, but I love the idea of new adventures. Absolutely. Mary and Orion walked away from the group to the far end of the lounging area. He was rubbing his neck and avoiding looking at her. Wonderful. We'll chat this weekend. Elizabeth greeted everyone in turn with a small wave. Aren't we missing someone? Who? I looked and everyone that had driven with us was present. You, Mary, and Jess are the Westmount Center staff, but don't we have three on-site athletes? Minx, Tiger, and... Wasn't there another OSA? She paused with a furrowed brow. Mouse, I supplied. She's driving down with her family. They pretty much have the weekend off from OSA duty. I think they're going to hang out at the Westmount Center booth? I lifted my voice at the end and turned to Jess for confirmation. She came to join us. Yes, Mary, Di, and Moo will be helping at the table located inside the larger Anderson Archery booth. But Mouse, Minx, and Tiger are not officially required to work it, though they all agreed to swing by and answer questions. They were given the option to ride down in the van since we were already coming, but they're paying their own way. Tiger bounded off the couch. Speaking of being off-duty, Jess, can I have my room key? I have places to go and ladies to meet. He stuffed the key into his pocket, grabbed his gear, and disappeared into the casino. Jess, could I have my key as well? I think I want to lie down. Is my room near Liam's and Orion's? Elizabeth asked. Yes. Our rooms are all in a row. Here's your key. Jess passed out the remaining keys. Here, Mom, let me grab your stuff. Liam grabbed Elizabeth's bag, and Orion offered to grab the bow case from Mary. The large, black, heavy case had wheels on one side, but was still very heavy. Everyone else stood up and gathered their luggage as we prepared to head up to the rooms. Chapter 2 Mary's in my room was between Minx and Jess's room, and the room now shared by Orion, Liam, and Logan. Moo hopped onto the queen bed nearest the window and dragged his heavy claws across the comforter from the edge to the center, turning in a circle until the entire comforter was in a ball in the center of the bed. He circled three times, then flopped onto the pile. Mary rolled the bow case into the corner, then dropped her bag on the other bed. That, she pointed at the bed with Moo, is yours. Moo rolled on his back, squirming right and left. With a giant sneeze, he flopped onto one side and stretched diagonally across the entire bed. I sat down next to him. What am I going to do with you, Moo? Upon hearing his name, he crawled across the bed and laid his head on my lap, then rolled his eyes up to plead for scratches. I flipped his cropped ears a few times, a souvenir from his previous owners, who had abandoned him to a rescue before Liam adopted him last fall. I leaned over and kissed the top of his nose, 
but I wasn't quick enough to pull away before his tongue flicked across my cheek. Gross. I got up to wash my face. Hey, what were you and Orion talking about? He seemed nervous. He was. He told me that he started dating a girl at his church in Salt Lake. I turned off the water and rushed from the bathroom. Oh no, I'm so sorry, Mary. Does that mean the Valentine's double date on Saturday is canceled? Are you okay? She bustled about the room, organizing clothing and unpacking her bow from the case. I'm fine, and the double date is still on. He just felt that it would be inappropriate not to tell me. She had told me last month that she had a crush on him. They had been spending a lot of time messaging each other and were pretty inseparable when we were in the same place. You're fine? She blew out a long breath. Yes, I'm pretty confident that this is only a minor setback. But in the rare case that I'm wrong, sitting around moping won't change anything. There was a knock at the door. I squinted at Mary. She seemed sad but not devastated. The tension in my shoulders dissolved when I realized she wasn't going to let it ruin her weekend. She and Orion were perfect for each other and enjoyed being together, and I didn't know why he was fighting the inevitable. I'm sorry. That's still a huge bummer. If you need some girl time, let me know. We'll ditch everyone to go shopping or goof off. No, you finally get to hang out with Liam. Bah, we can sneak off for a few hours if necessary. Besides, he's riding back to the center with us after the tournament. I'll be seeing so much of him that I'll be sick of him in no time. She rolled her eyes at me, then went to the door as the knocking reoccurred, urgent and fast. Hold your horses! She peeked through the peephole before opening the door. It's Logan. He burst into the room, running a hand through his hair. This is bad. Real bad. I made a mock salute. Angels reporting for duty! Remember that guy that I told you was hit by a van? He died. I pulled out a chair for him to sit in. Oh no, Logan, were you close? Mary moved to her backpack and pulled out a small notebook that would easily slip into a pocket. His name? Mike Champ. I don't know him beyond a high at tournaments. Logan scrubbed his face with his hands. Mary scribbled on the blank page. Do you know anything else about him? He worked back east for a politician. He was, uh, what do you call them? Makes politicians look good? Photoshop? Stylist? Money? A cavalcade of lobbyists? I guessed. Spin doctor? Mary looked up. Logan stared out the window. Yes, a spin doctor. I walked over and patted him on the back. This might not have anything to do with the tournament. If he worked for a politician, then probably half the country wanted him dead. Maybe, but why did the same van almost hit us? And what about my roommate's drinks getting doped? And didn't I tell you about what I just learned? Mary dropped her notebook on the table, then pulled out a tablet and started poking. Don't keep us hanging. What did you learn? Someone hung a banner on the railing that said, The playing field will be leveled. You know how you go up the stairs from the casino floor up to the arena and the shooting rooms? They hung it over the railing so you can see it as you come up. Mary nodded along with his description. She had been attending this tournament for about a decade, while this was my first time. I mused over the wording. The playing field will be leveled. What does that even mean? He shrugged. No clue, but it sets my teeth on edge. I nodded. It sounds ominous, like a revolution. There was another knock, but it wasn't from the entrance. There was a door set back along the wall between our room and the next. I got up and unlocked it. Jess was on the other side. Look, our rooms are connected. I can come over in my jammies to make sure you two aren't getting into trouble. I'm going to head down to the arena to check on our booth, then gossip with some coach friends. What do you have to gossip about? I teased her. We can commiserate about our students driving us crazy. She stuck out her tongue at me, then disappeared only to be replaced by Minx. She had changed into a tight V-neck polo shirt, skinny jeans, and high heels. What are you guys doing in here? Logan stopped rubbing his neck and stared at Minx. I chuckled. You going somewhere fancy? She flicked her red hair over her shoulder. Everywhere in Vegas is fancy. I waited for Logan to say something, but he sat with his mouth hanging open slightly. 
I shook my head. Remember that guy hit by the van last night? Logan just got a call that he passed away. Poor man, that's awful for him. Come hang out in my room, Logan, while the girls change. I want to get downstairs to grab a drink and play the slots. Logan nodded and followed her back into her room. I locked the door behind him. Mary was rooting around in her luggage. I'm so excited to wear some non-archery clothing. I pulled out a loose-fitting jersey knit top with an asymmetric hem and flowing sleeves. I know what you mean. I had fallen into the habit of always wearing snug-fitting clothing that wouldn't interfere with a bowstring. On a daily basis at the center, Mary and I would grab our bows and shoot whenever we had a half an hour of free time. Therefore, we were always dressed in a way that was conducive to shooting. Will we be able to practice today? Maybe. The practice range is usually packed, but I hear they're extending practice hours. We can swing by there later if you want. There was a knock on the door and I moved to answer while Mary grabbed her clothing and ran to the bathroom, clutching it to her chest. I opened the door to find Liam and Orion standing in the hallway. Orion looked beyond me into the empty room, his mouth pulled into a frown. Hey guys, we're about to head downstairs. Liam sucked in air through his teeth. Unfortunately, they need us on the show floor. They're setting up the booths and there's been some problems. Do you know where Logan is? Anderson Archery is one of the companies affected and we could use his help. Moo jumped off the bed at the sound of Liam's voice and padded over to the door. I knocked on the shared door to Minx's room before opening it. Logan, Liam needs you. Liam explained the problem to Logan. It was regarding inventory and some issue with how the booths had been packaged after the last trade show. Before they left, Liam turned to me. Sorry about this. Do you want me to take Moo? I shook my head. Don't worry about it. Work's work. Dragging around an awesome dog will be a distraction. Moo can stay with me. Moo sat down and offered Liam his paw. Moo and I had been working on how to shake, and now he offered his paw whatever he wanted attention. When Liam didn't immediately shake Moo's paw, Moo dragged the paw down Liam's thigh, causing him to jump. Easy, buddy. We'll hang out soon enough, all three of us. I smiled as Liam shook Moo's paw. Once Moo finished his trick, he felt satisfied to come back to my side and lean heavily on my hip. Mary, Minx, and I are about to head downstairs. I'll have my phone with me. I'll let you know when we're done. He smiled at me before he left. I shut the door and Mary's head popped out of the bathroom. They're gone? Yes. Are you going to avoid Orion all weekend? No, not at all. But a bit of absence isn't a bad idea either. Let him miss me. What do you think of this outfit? She gave a twirl. She had on yellow ballet flats, skinny jeans, and a flowing shirt. Adorable. Hot stuff, Mary. Minx had fluffed up and curled her red hair. Let's get this party started. I slipped Moo's backpack on him and moved his essentials into the pocket. I checked that I had my ID, money, and the room key as we closed the hotel door behind us. Two gentlemen walked by with rolling bow cases and gave us a nod. The man in back with an impressive beard flowed down his chest, cut his eyes to Moo an inch closer to the wall. Afternoon, ladies. That's a mighty big dog. I smiled and replied over my shoulder as we continued down the elevators. Yes, he is. I hadn't quite figured out how to reply to these type of statements. It wasn't a question to answer, but it seemed rude not to reply. It was like a compulsion for people to comment on Moo's size. It was often followed by a series of questions. How big was he? How much did he eat? Did I ever ride him like a horse? Etc. I was putting together a small list of witty retorts, but usually a quick smile and acknowledgement was enough. Mink stepped into the elevator and pressed the button for the lobby. I'm going to have a strawberry daiquiri, then gin and tonics, then a mudslide, then finish it up with a beer or three. I crinkled my eyebrows in disbelief. We have to shoot tomorrow. She waved a hand in the air. They say that a hangover is better than beta blockers for calming nerves. Plus, this tournament doesn't count toward our ranking. But you can win money, and if you drink all that this evening, you'll be more than hungover. Mary quirked an eyebrow at Minx. You really want to do less than your best? Elevator doors open, and Minx sighed dramatically as she exited. Fine. I'll have to figure out a different vice to entertain me this weekend. She muttered under her breath. 
bunch of sticks in the mud. I heard that. I followed her out of the elevator and hugged her from behind, pinning her arms to her side. You love us. I was here with my friends, my dog, and the man I was crazy about at a tournament to shoot archery. I couldn't imagine a more perfect weekend. If I say that I love you, will you let me go? Minx laughed as she said it. I love you. Mary hopped in front of us. What about me? I love you too. Let's get me a drink. We laughed as we went up to one of the many bars. Minx ordered a drink while Mary and I asked for water. I stepped back to the sidewalk designated by yellow carpeting. Moo was technically only allowed on the walkway. A huge group of men was at the other side of the circular bar. This style of bar was spread throughout the casino floor. At least three were visible from where we stood. The men were adorned with hats and shirts that proclaimed their sponsorship from various bow companies. A man called out his greetings to Minx and Mary, and I followed them over to say hi. A tall guy lifted his hand to offer a high five. Minx stepped forward, but Moo leaned in front of her, and Minx's hand sailed off to the side as she caught herself from falling. A tall guy with a beak-like nose laughed. Nice job, Minx. Hope you have better aim this weekend. The group chuckled, and he continued but that's what I expect from a girl. Women don't know how to do something complicated like a high five, right guys? The men around him chuckled again. Minx's face grew bright red. Shut up, Uncle Mike. You only think that because women keep slapping you across the face when you try to high five them. The chuckles turned to guffaws while one guy in back called out, Burn! I leaned over to Mary. Uncle Mike... His full name is Mike and Callis, but they call him Uncle Mike, or The Uncle. Uncle Mike narrowed his eyes at Minx, then raised his glass. You got me there. The ladies are heartbroken that they can't tie me down. Unless you want to try. He drained his glass and placed it on the bar. Minx crossed her arms. No, thank you. Uncle Mike pushed off the bar. I'm going to go check the target assignments. He passed us, giving Mary and me a once-over and a wink. A majority of the men followed, but one stayed behind to talk to Minx. The male that remained was just taller than me and average in looks. In fact, most archers started to blend together after a while, and I doubted I could pick this camouflage swath one from a lineup. But he didn't have eyes for me as he approached Minx and shook her hand. Nice to see someone give Uncle Mike a hard time. I'm lucky. Glad to see that someone appreciates my big mouth. She looked him over, top to bottom, then smiled at him. I think it's a nice mouth. Can I get you another drink? His eyes rested on her lips as she licked them. She nodded. I'm Minx, and this is Mary, Di, and Moo. They were just leaving. He gave us a passing glance, a nod, then turned back to Minx. He placed a hand on her lower back and steered her to the bar. I shrugged. So much for three Loggins angels. Mary looked at Lucky and shook her head. I hope this vice doesn't leave her hungover like drinking does. What now? The bartender held our waters aloft. I slid a tip onto the bar. Can I see where we're going to shoot? Then maybe check out the animal area for Moo. At the sound of his name, Moo danced at my side, then lifted his head and let out a long, woo-woo. Heads around the casino lifted and peered around slot machines for the source of the noise. Moo, don't get yourself uninvited. I started walking, and he fell in stride with me. Sounds like a plan. I'm pretty sure everything is in the same place as always. Mary chugged her water and handed it to a casino waitress as she walked by in a colorful outfit that looked like a one-piece swimsuit with high heels and black stockings. A woman in her 20s thundered down the walkway directly toward us. She had reddish hair with thick pink highlights. I stepped aside to let her by, but she veered to intersect me. Hi, I'm Pinky, and I need to talk to you, Di. She nodded at Mary, then turned back to me. She had lovely blue eyes that were staring at me with a frightening intensity. Um, me? I think you might have me mistaken. No, I saw the video about you being the new pro staff coordinator for Westmount Anderson Industries, and as a fellow woman... I know you'll appreciate the points I put together about pay inequality in the industry. She rifled through a backpack and handed me a pamphlet. I took it on instinct but shook my head. I'm not the pro staff coordinator. 
the video was mistaken. I don't have any control over pay for men or women. Her face fell. Rats, you don't work for Westmound? No, I mean, I don't not work for Westmound. I blew out a breath. Let me start over. I, I mean, we both work at the Westmound Training Center for Competitive Shooting Sports in Wyoming. I, along with Liam, gave a speech to some visiting archers about getting sponsorship. You know Liam? Mary snorted next to me. Does she know him? They're rather close. I blushed and elbowed Mary. You are? Well, then you can talk to him. Tell him all about this. She pointed at the black piece of fabric tied around her arm. It's a disgrace that the women's pro division is paid so little. The tournament raised the men's payout to 100000 for the winner, in part by contributions from Westmount. And do you know how much women get for first place? Do you? She jabbed a finger at me while her face turned an unhealthy purple. I took a half a step back. Less than that? Five thousand. I grimaced and sucked air through my teeth. That's a lot less than the men. I looked at the pamphlet she had handed to me. There were charts and graphs detailing the payout, entry fee, and participation numbers. I'd need to dig in more later. That can't be right. It's right, and Westmount is responsible, in part, for the discrepancy. You say that you're devoted to women in the industry, but you don't put your money where your mouth is. So you'll talk to Liam about it. Mark! She yelled behind me at someone passing by. I'll catch you guys later. Read that and then do something. She jogged away. Is this right? I turned to Mary. Let's walk and talk. I don't want to get cornered again. We headed across the casino floor at a brisk pace, and I followed Mary when she veered left past an open-air restaurant and down a huge corridor. Yes, I'm sure that information Pinky gave you was correct. The difference in pay between the genders has been a hot topic for a while. We've talked about it before. Yeah, but this is a difference of 20 to 1. There's Tiger. Tiger! His head swiveled around until he spotted us. He had two girls on each side of him. Hey, Mary. Die. Let me introduce you to my new friends. This is Daphne, Bethany, Abigail, and Carissa. Nice to meet you all. Tiger, do you know anything about this? I turned the pamphlet toward him. The smile fell from his face. Gals, I'll catch up with you at the bar. They implored him to hurry up, then left, casting glances over their shoulder. They put an extra wiggle in their walk, and one of them blew a kiss over her shoulder. He grinned after them, watching them go, before turning back to grab the pamphlet from my hand and flip it over. This is Pinky's doing, isn't it? Easy, Tiger. Why are you all worked up? I wouldn't have asked if I had known it was a tender topic. They want to increase the payout in the women's division. Where do you think that money would come from? Are you talking about those black armband chicks? I jumped at the male voice in my ear and turned around. Uncle Mike was standing behind me. Don't sneak up on me like that. Sorry, I'm Mike and Callis. Hi, Mary. It's nice to see you again. He swept his worn Anderson archery cap off his head and smoothed his hair. The tips of her ears turned pink. Nice to see you too, Uncle Mike. He waved his hand and winked at her. You can call me Uncle Mike, but not Uncle Mike. It sounds wrong coming from you. I shook my head. Anyways, we were talking. Tiger held up the pamphlet to Unc. About this. Tell them. Tell them. Mary turned to Tiger and quirked an eyebrow. Leaping lizards, Tiger. It was just a question. He spun around on her. But it's not a fair question. If I argue that things are fine the way they are, then it looks like I'm a sexist pig. But it isn't only a matter of equal pay for equal work. Unc held up a hand. Gom was the laughing, loudmouth guy who had gotten into it with Minx. He had done a 180. Though he was still a jokester, he added a professional and steady demeanor to the mix. Judging by the expression on Mary's face as she watched him, she was a fan of the combination. Here, let me explain something. We would love to be able to pay the women the same amount as the men. Nothing would make us happier, and as soon as the purchasing power and entry numbers are the same, the payout will be the same. I stepped back and took a deep breath. So the payout is strictly based on entry numbers? There are 20 times more men than women that enter? 
significantly fewer women in the division, for sure. By significantly fewer, do you mean 1 20th? Entry numbers aren't the only factor we're talking about. There's also buying power. People look to the men when they're picking out equipment. I leaped on his words. Hogwash. That's a circular argument at best. You pay the guys a ton of money, which makes people take notice, then say that because people take notice that the men deserve money. I had seen this reasoning in the tech industry. So the women's division gets 1 20th the payout of men. And how big is each division? He rubbed the back of his neck. The women's division is one third as big. But don't get all huffy at me. The difference was made up by money contributed by our sponsors, including your company. I didn't hear of them offering any money for the women's division. If they did, we certainly wouldn't turn it down. Westmount donated money just to the men's division? Someone did. Either Westmount, Anderson Archery, McSites, I don't know. One of you guys' companies for sure. But come on, let's not fight about it. We would love to give more prize money out to the women's division, especially the pro division. I craned my head around to try and pop the tension out of my neck. Are you on the tournament staff? I'm the pro chair. I represent the pros, both men and women, during tournament planning. He turned away from me slightly, dismissing me from the rest of the conversation. Hey, Mary, what are you doing after opening ceremonies? A bunch of us are grabbing dinner on the strip, and you're more than welcome to join us. My treat. He cast a glance at me. I'd invite you to, but the reservation is set. I'm sure you'd want to stay with your dog. Of course, I replied, but he had already turned back to Mary. I rolled my eyes at Tiger. He snickered, then gave me a wave as he headed toward the bar and the women waiting for him to catch up. Chapter 3 Mary cast a glance at me. A steady blush rose in her cheeks. Gee, I don't... Unk grabbed her hand. Come with me. Don't break my heart. We'll head out as soon as the pro division is called up on stage. So, 8 to 8.30? Mary's face fell. Oh, I didn't think it through. We have to go to bed early. Recurve shoot at the first line. Ouch. Rain check? He gave her hand a squeeze and let it go. Thanks, Unc. That'd be nice. She gave him a wave, then watched him as he walked away. Well, 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 Mary. I do believe he asked you on a date. Yes, I noticed that. I'm rather flattered. She continued to stare after him. Mink sashayed up. I saw you talking to Unc. Be careful around him. Lucky says Unc is a real womanizer. Mary rolled her eyes. Like I'm taking advice from Lucky. Isn't he married? Minx looked around then stepped closer. You can't tell anyone, but he's almost divorced. Like Di. He swore me to secrecy because they haven't told anyone yet. He values his privacy. I raised an eyebrow at her. If no one else knows, then wouldn't they think you were flirting with a married man? She blew us a raspberry and avoided looking me in the eyes. It's just one drink. No biggie. Login, Liam, we're over here. She waved an arm in the air, then stormed down the hall in their direction. Come on, Moo. I bent over to pet his side as he sprawled across the carpeting of the casino. He cut an eye to me, then covered his face with a paw, rubbing at his eyes. I gave a little jingle to the leash. Come on, buddy. Get up. He opened his mouth in a yawn, his long tongue flopping out, before slowly rising up to stretch his left leg out behind him, tripping Mary as she walked by to follow Minks. He stretched out the right leg and extended his nose straight up in the air while letting out a long groan. I reached under his chin and gave him a scratch, then leaned over to kiss him on the nose. Who's the handsomest guy around? I spread kisses all over the top of his furry head, and his tail swished back and forth. You could make a man jealous talking like that. I looked over my shoulder to see Liam smiling at me. He stepped up, put an arm around my shoulder, and gave it a squeeze. I gave Liam an exaggerated once-over. If it's a competition between you and Moo, it might be a close fight. Oh? I caught myself giggling at him. Well, Moo can scratch his ear with his foot. He reached out and caught my hand, then rubbed his thumb across the back as he pulled me in closer. Then maybe Moo should take you out on a date instead. 
I stepped into the circle of his arms and my cheek ached from smiling so hard. I shook my head at him. I already have plans this weekend. Moo danced at the end of the leash, then circled us, the leash pulling Liam and me closer. What about your plans today? I was thinking we could grab a meal alone. I craned my head back to continue to look into his eyes as I moved closer. Focusing was difficult. His hand was so warm. Mary was going to show me where we're shooting tomorrow. I want to set up my bow and shoot a few airs if possible. Other than eating and going to bed early, that's it. He laced his fingers through mine. And the opening ceremony? We could skip that. He shook his head. We're sponsors. We need to be there. A man behind me cleared his throat loudly. Uh, Excuse me, Lumberjack. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I wanted to say hi before we leave. Liam sighed at the nickname he hated, or possibly the interruption. He winked at me, then took the leash from my hand and untangled Moo from around our legs. The man behind me had his arm in a sling and was dragging a bow case with the other hand. Two other men, identical twins from the looks of them, and a woman stood behind them with their luggage. Liam handed the leash to me and stepped over to the man. Good to see you, Hip. He held out a hand and turned to the other three. Cat, Beans, Frank, you guys ready to shoot? Hip shook his head. No, we're leaving. He shifted his weight between his feet and cast glances at the group before continuing. I, I mean, we decided it was best if we go. I know it's the first tournament of the season and our shooter agreement said that we would compete, but... He gestured at his arm in the sling. The accident last night with Mike Champ in that van. I twisted my shoulder. Frank and Beans hurt their back. At the mention of Mike Champ, I caught Mary's eye and waved her over before turning to hip. You were there with Mike when he was hit? I'm so sorry. What happened? We all were, he gestured to the group. We had been drinking and went to cross the street at the light. The van ran the light. It was awful. The lady, Kat, sobbed and covered her mouth. Excuse me. Frank put an arm around her and they walked off as Mary joined me. Bean stepped in closer. He didn't run that light. He waited until we stepped off the curb, then gunned it. Hip reared around to face him. We're not going through that again. I'm telling you, he gunned it. He tried to kill us. No, he clearly didn't see us because he veered at the last second. If Mike hadn't tripped forward... His face went white. I'm sorry, Cat was holding his arm. It was sheer luck she fell backwards away from him. She didn't sleep at all, and the rest of us are hurt. I hope you understand us pulling out of the tournament... Mary pulled me over to where Bean stood, rubbing his back. Hi, I'm Mary, and this is Di. I think we met before? Bean looked at Mary and me with a blank expression. He didn't seem totally convinced. Yeah, maybe. Mary pressed on. That's so crazy about that van purposely trying to run you down. Did you see the driver? He shook his head. I told the police that I'd never saw the driver. None of us did. You know how you always have a vague sense of where cars are? I know that van stopped at the corner, but when we were starting to cross, the driver gunned it. We jumped back, except Mike. He was pretty hammered and he fell forward. The van clipped his head. I shook my head and made disapproving sounds. How awful. Did you see the van veer away like Hip did? It seems like it would have hit Mike straight on if it didn't, but I wouldn't put money on it one way or the other. He grabbed his luggage and turned to follow Hip down the hall. I gotta go. My ride's leaving. I looked at Mary. Thoughts? Why would the van had tried to hit them, then try to avoid them? The driver had last second bout of killer's remorse? Or maybe Mike wasn't the real target? Or he wasn't trying to kill them, but just scare or injure them? Or maybe Hip was wrong altogether and the driver did it on purpose, with either Mike as the target or someone else in the group? And Mike was the unluckiest? Mary tapped a finger on her teeth. It's awfully chancy of the driver to bank on no one seeing him. I nodded and extended a hand through Liam's arm as he rejoined us. Maybe a witness did see the driver? The police might have a sketch. They might even have a subject in custody. Liam chuckled and squeezed my hand resting on his arm. You two find a mystery everywhere you go. But first, maybe we could grab lunch. A dark-haired girl interrupted Liam. Liam, it is so good to see you. 
He was dumbfounded for a second before he dropped my hand and quickly hugged her. Ivana, this is Mary and Di. She was tall with dark curly hair and a slight accent that I couldn't place. She spoke English perfectly, with syllables crisp and distinct, but with a lilt that seemed to say it wasn't her first language. She replied to Liam's introduction with, Nice to meet you, but she didn't bother to even look at us. You will introduce me to Jessica. I have questions about the training center we will be visiting. Liam turned back to me. I need to take care of this. Do you know where Jess is? She was going to meet up with some coach friends to catch up. Do you want me to call her? He shook his head. Reception is lousy in the casino. I think I know where she is. He reached out to squeeze my shoulder. Don't eat without me. This won't take long. As he turned to leave, Ivana turned and gave me a once-over, then fell into step beside him. Mary snorted next to me. Who's she? I figured you know. You're the one with all the international experience. Jess said that the Bordistan national team was coming to the training center next week to train for a bit. She shook her head. She didn't represent Bordistan at any events I attended. Maybe she's new? I watched Liam walking with her as they disappeared into the crowd of people walking down the large hallway. Everything in Vegas was bigger, and the hallway could easily hold 20 people side by side. A large group of young adults passed us and called out to Moo. Sweet dog, do you have a saddle for that thing? Hey, Mary. Several members of the group wore cat ears, and at least one person had a tail dangling from the back of their pants. Hair color ranged from pink, blue, and green to midnight black. Tattoos peeked out from under jerseys proclaiming they were from Austin, Texas, with the logo Keep Archery Weird across the back. The archers that I had seen at the training center in Wyoming had either been of the camo and beard variety or the professional athlete type. They're archers? Mary laughed. The Casino Cup has archers from all over the United States and the world. You'll see it all here. Anyone can shoot archery, and this tournament will prove it. Indy! She squealed and launched herself at a tall, lanky young man passing by. He awkwardly hugged her back, his elbows sticking out. I reached up and wrapped an arm around his neck. Indy, it's good to see you. Are you shooting or filming? Filming with Dad and Candy. He rolled his eyes at Candy's name. We'll be uploading video all weekend to our internet channel, Cold Hard Facts. You'll watch and tell your friends to watch, right? Of course. The last time we had seen Cold, Indy's father, was at the Outdoor Industry Trade Show, where he had been thin and agitated. How's your dad doing? He's not doing so... He trailed off and dug around in his bag before pulling out a DVD case. Don't tell anyone, but I think he's using drugs again. He's been clean for years, but Candy... I hate her. I'm going to see if Minx will talk to him. Can you give this to Liam or Orion? He handed me the case. I flipped it over, and in silver marker was written, Westmount Summit Footage. Sure. Didn't your dad already give them the footage? At the OIT show, Liam and Cold had had a disagreement about the contract Cold had signed to film the Westmount Summit and put together the video. Cold had given Liam whatever Cold had in his bag at the moment. He shrugged. I found copies on the hard drive and wanted to learn to use the editing program. He flipped his bangs out of his eyes with a jerk of his head. Liam and Orion are cool, and I thought, just give it to them, okay? Sure thing. My heart twisted a little. He looked so young standing in front of me. If you ever need anything... I let my voice trail off, leaving the possibilities open. He was the same age as Mouse, but she had two supportive parents. Andy looked up to his dad, but Cold seemed on a train bound for trouble based on rumors and his erratic behavior. Indy blushed a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks. See you guys later. He set off down the hall, grabbing Minks as he passed. They hugged, then she nodded, and they continued walking. Logan walked over from talking with Minks. He cast glances over his shoulder as Minks as she walked away. Have you figured out who killed Mike Champ yet? Ready to confront the killer, or however you do it? Mary rolled her eyes. You underestimate how much skill and time it takes to solve these murders. I snickered. Especially when we have no clue what we're doing? Mary gasped. Don't say that. We totally know what we're doing. We're... She turned so her back was to mind and extended her arm straight out, 
Her index fingers pointed to mimic a gun. Loggins angels. I pushed my back to hers and replicated her stance for a second before giggling. I stepped forward so I could face her and Loggin. We talked to a couple of eyewitnesses to the crash. They stopped to talk to Liam and we snuck in a few questions. Moo pawed at my shin and whined. I checked the time. Can we walk and talk? I think Moo needs to go outside. I pulled out the map of the casino with the pet facilities marked. Which one is the closest? I ran a finger over the paper, trying to locate our position. Mary peeked at the map, then jabbed a finger into one corner, bending the paper. That one is right next to the competition and practice ranges. I refolded the paper. Perfect. Lead the way. Wait up. Logan jogged to my side. You didn't tell me what you learned from the eyewitnesses. We dodged around a group of men wearing shooter jerseys, their fronts covered in archery company names. They seemed to have two versions of what happened. One was that the driver waited until they started to cross the road, then hit Mike. The other guy thought that the driver just wasn't paying attention and tried to veer away at the last second. So either it was an accident or purposeful. We haven't really nailed anything down at all. Mary shook her head. It's part of our process. We'll learn a little more about his life, what enemies he has, that kind of thing, then start investigating. Logan stepped in front of me. Whoa, let's not forget your real focus, angels, protecting me. I grabbed his arm to pull him down the hallway. Moo was doing a high trot, a sign that he was eager to get out. Don't worry, we'll protect you. Mike was probably the target. He shook his head. I heard the guy rev the engine right before he almost hit us. That gave me pause. That's what the other guy said. He heard revving as well. We ascended a set of stairs, and it was obvious we were near the tournament site. A trickle of people carrying bows and arrows in the hallways led to crowds of people mingling at the top of the stairs. There was a window with a check-in sign above it and a snack bar that served beer and wine with a line 20 people deep. Signs advertised the various shooting halls and the direction of the trade show. Banners for various archery companies hung on the banister, including one with Logan's face the size of a small car. I stumbled over the last step as I stared around. Wow. A group of kids ran past. Someone yelled at them not to run. Mary grabbed me out of their way. Come this way. Past the last shooting room should be the door that takes you outside to a pet place. But I'm not sure that it's correct since we went up one flight. We can check in afterwards. I followed her as she turned right and followed the wide hallway down. People pressed in from all sides, and Moo and I had to weave through them. The farther we went, the more the crowd cleared out. Wow, I had no idea there would be this many people. Mary dodged around a woman in a wheelchair who was rolling over to get a picture taken in front of a banner declaring the year and name of the tournament. This is nothing. It will be even crazier tomorrow. There are over 5,000 people shooting. I have our schedule all lined up so we get here in plenty of time. What time are we getting up? 4 a.m.? I threw out the ridiculous time with a laugh. No, you can sleep until 5. I stopped laughing inside. That was far too early. We passed a door designated for tournament staff only, and Mary pushed on the door leading outside. I followed her out onto a large balcony and startled a lady leaning against the wall next to the door outside. She was short and curvy, with cherub cheeks and black hair back home to the heavens. You startled me, and now you've caught me with my dirty little secret. She waved a hand around, holding a thin black rod. Moo pulled me past her to a square of fake grass and a few plastic bushes. He sniffed and snuffled as Mary stopped to talk. What is that? Mary pointed to the black rod and I turned in their direction to hear the answer. E-cigarette. I quit smoking ten years ago, and nine years ago, and eight years ago. She laughed and took a drag off the end of the e-cig. Every year at this tournament I would relapse, but not this year. I figured out that it wasn't the nicotine that had me relapsing. It was the act of stopping everything I was doing, going outside and taking a break. So I got one of these. There isn't even any nicotine in here, just flavor. But the opportunity to cut out of the office for 10 minutes is a miracle. Don't tell Bobby about the no nicotine thing. He has no issue with my smoking breaks, but he might feel differently if he knew that they were really Bobby breaks. I found myself laughing along with her eruption of words. She was bubbly and cheerful. I raised a hand in greeting. 
We won't tell a soul. I'm Di. This is Logan and Mary. I know, Logan and Mary. Hi. Nice to meet you, Di. I'm Becca Bishop. And what's your dog's name? So big. Moo. He was finished with his business. I passed the leash over to Mary while I got out a baggie to dispose of the evidence. He's very friendly. Mary dragged Moo over. Sit. Shake. As Moo lifted his huge paw and offered it to Becca, she laughed with delight. So nice to meet you. What a gentleman. She kneeled down to scratch his neck, and Moo closed his eyes in bliss. If you had a credit card, I think I could ask you on a date, Moo. You are twice the gentleman of anyone else around here. Present company excluded, of course. Logan leaned on the wall next to Becca. Archer's behaving badly. The worst. They love to act like they are the height of professionalism, but behind closed doors they whine like babies. They prefer to complain to me than to Bobby. No idea why. I'm as likely to tell them to shut their face holes as Bobby is. I snorted at the turn of phrase. Who's whining? Oh, there's always something. A bunch of recurvers were complaining at having to shoot so early. People that want me to rearrange 500 other people's target assignments so they can shoot on the same target as their friends. Pro-compound men wanting refunds even though it is past the refund date. And the pro-compound women are just as bad, constantly hounding me about why their payout isn't more. Every year it's the same thing. Wine, wine, wine. I swear after this year I'm done. Done. But I also say that every year. Then afterwards I forget and swear that it wasn't so bad. It's a sickness. Nothing unusual about this year? Same old, same old? I tried to keep my tone casual and relaxed. People would get suspicious when you were too eager for an answer. Recurbers always shoot early, and we never rearrange target assignments unless there's a genuine need, like accessibility issues for the para-archers. Those are normal complaints, but I have pat answers for both. And, of course, the pro-female compounders always complain about making less money. But since Bobby raised the amount the men make, the women are super pissed this year. I can't blame them, but I'm not getting into that again. Oh boy, you do not want to open that can of worms. I said something when I was hired a dozen years ago, and I'm still smart from the butt chewing I got on that one. You think I propose that we go into the home of the male archers, steal their undies, and shoot their dogs. They about flipped the table when I suggested increasing the ladies' payout. Who decides on the payout? Bobby's the president of the organization, so he has the most say. There's a board that contributes to the decision, though they mostly follow his lead. The board is almost all professional male archers, so of course they're big fans of increasing the men's payout. There's always a few judges and tournament directors, but everyone is all about keeping the pro men happy. It's a good old boys club, but not my job to change the world. She took a long drag off the e-cig and blew out a cloud of water vapor, slightly scented with vanilla. Logan shifted uncomfortably. He had benefited greatly last year when he won the tournament. What about the compound men dropping out of the tournament? Becca's eyebrows knit up. That is kind of unusual. There's always a few people that drop out, but this year has been more than normal. Maybe the flu is going around or something? Anyways, it was great to meet you, Moo and I. Nice to see you, Logan and Mary, but I better get back to work before Bobby catches me. She gave away and snuck back through the door, letting it slam behind her. I chuckled. She's so fun. I took Moo's leash back and scratched his rump. Mary smoothed her hair down as the breeze blew strands all around her face. She's always like that. Talk, talk, talk. But she's awesome. We might need to accidentally bump into her a few more times. I nodded at Mary. Definitely. She was a wealth of information. Now what? Logan grabbed the door and held it open for me. How about we find the van driver so I can compete tomorrow with a clear head? I stepped through the door and turned to hear Mary's answer. Sure, Logan. First, we'll watch out. I flipped my head around to see that I was inches from running into a man's chest. Excuse me. I lifted a hand to stop my momentum, then looked up into Moose's eyes towering overhead. Moose was a mover and shaker within the industry, a man in the know. At least that's how he described himself when we met last month. I was still not convinced. He chuckled and looked down at me. 
It's okay. I'm used to women throwing themselves at me. I'm glad I caught you. Someone said they saw you heading down this way. I want to introduce you to two of my up-and-coming archers. This is Hornet and B. he gestured to me. This is Di, the new pro staff manager at Westmount Anderson Industries. I see there's an insect theme. I extended my hand to greet them. They were probably in their early 20s and only slightly taller than me. Not short, but not tall. Liam had explained that the really tall archers had a disadvantage since taller usually meant longer draw lengths. The equipment in the industry was most efficient for average height archers, whatever that meant. Neither man smiled as they greeted me, but kept a demeanor that I imagined they thought made them seem important and cool. I needed to clear up Moose's misunderstanding. Pleased to meet you, but unfortunately there's been some bad information going around. I'm not the pro staff coordinator for anything. I'm just the computer person at the training center in Wyoming. Moose leaned back and gave me a dubious look. So you didn't give a speech to a bunch of kids at the training center on how to get sponsorship? Well, I faltered. I had done that. It was a plan concocted to investigate after a murder, which was not something I was eager to share. Liam had me do it because... I couldn't think of a valid excuse, but I had started this sentence and needed to finish it. He thought it would be fun? Moose crossed his arm and clearly didn't buy my explanation. Someone filmed it and put it online, but they said I was the new pro staff manager, and that's not true at all. The rumor started there, and now everyone believes it is fact. Moose nodded, and his face broke into a smile. I get it, he gave me a wink. I know how these things work, so I won't push it, but know that I know. I had no clue what he thought he knew. I swear, I'm not... He cut me off. No, no, I understand. Keep an eye on these two this weekend and we'll talk in the future. He gave me another wink and left with his two archers in tow. Mary rolled her eyes. That guy. You guys could have had my back on that one. I wasn't genuinely angry, but I gave Mary a mock stern face. She waved a hand at me. You don't need us. Besides, he was going to believe what he wanted to believe. Come on, I'll show you where we shoot. Chapter 4 She gave me a tour of the shooting ranges, and we found our target assignments for the next day. As we headed into the trade show, I scanned the crowd for Liam. My stomach grumbled, and I pressed a hand to my middle. Breakfast had been a long time ago, and we had skipped lunch. The trade show was smaller than the OIT show we had visited last month, but most of the major companies were there. Each booth had a crowd several people deep. Logan turned to me when I faltered and fell behind. Today is the worst day. The show is set up all weekend, but everyone's eager to get to the booths first. If you want to explore, I'd recommend waiting a day. Can we swing by the Anderson booth? I want to make sure they don't need me. I nodded and pulled Moo in close. We weaved through the crowd, dodging the bows that many people were carrying. It was an obstacle course of bow limbs, stabilizers, and sights sticking out in every direction. People turned and moved with no awareness of how their equipment swung into my path. I ducked as a carbon side rod almost took off my head. The floor was concrete, and as we rounded the corner, I realized that it was actually the top floor of a large arena. We moved around a bar, and rows and rows of plastic fold-down seats were visible. The far half of the seating was covered by advertising from various bow companies. The floor of the arena had green, fake, plastic grass and targets along the far side. I wandered over to the railing behind the top row of seats. Mary fell and stepped next to me as Logan walked over to the Anderson Archery booth. Pretty cool, huh? She gestured down to the shooting venue below. Who shoots down there? I imagined being down there with the crowds of people in the stands, watching my every move and shot. The thought made my stomach flip over. Who do you think? Who gets all the money and attention? The pro-compound men? I guessed. You got it in one. It's pretty cool, though. The whole crowd hangs on every shot. Die. Get over here. I turned around to see Logan waving me over. I recognized a few men around him from the Westmount Summit. They were employees of Anderson Archery. 
Thankfully, I had spent my Christmas break memorizing the employee list from the various Westmount companies. I greeted everyone that I recognized, then Logan rattled off introductions to a handful of people, men and women that I hadn't met, but were wearing Anderson Archery jerseys. I smiled and shook hands, but failed to retain any of the names. They looked at me eagerly, waiting for me to say something. I was befuddled by the attention and unclear on what was expected of me. I nervously twisted Moo's leash in my hand. This is Moo. I'm wishing you all the best this weekend. Everyone smiled, and I was relieved that I had guessed at the right thing to say. A few people greeted Moo, and a woman stepped forward to speak to me. Her first name was embroidered on her chest above a long list of sponsors. More likely it was her pronoun, since Terrier was hardly a common name. You as well. I hear that you are shooting in the recurve division? She smoothly edged between me and the group, focusing my attention on her. I was relieved to be able to focus on one person and could appreciate the deft move. Yes, I am. I haven't been back shooting for long. This tournament is something. First time, she shifted her weight, blocking a man who had scooted forward to join us. I hid a chuckle at the strategy. Yes. If you need anything, let me know. And we should grab a drink while you're here. I would love to pick your brain. Oh, I... I couldn't possibly imagine what she wanted to know or why she was so interested when the memory of Moose's conversation helped connect a few dots. I looked at Mary then Logan for help. Logan struggled to hide a smile, but stepped forward. We'll see what we can work out. Di has a lot of responsibilities this weekend. I swung over to him, and it was my turn to hide a smile. I didn't have much to do besides shoot for a few hours a day and solve a murder while assuring Logan that no one was out to get him. Wait, there was one other thing that was a priority. I scanned the crowd and my heart flipped when I saw Liam heading in our direction. Customers in the booth pushed through the group I was standing with, and I took the opportunity to follow them toward Liam. We locked eyes. Even when people stepped between us, the second they passed, he was still looking right at me. Moo tugged at the leash to get to Liam. I was just as eager, and we closed the distance. When I was finally in front of him, I was at a loss for words. Hi. Want to grab some food? I leaned in closer and opened my mouth to enthusiastically endorse the idea when Mary's voice startled me from behind. Great idea! Logan, we're grabbing lunch! Logan left the booth and bounded out. Awesome! Where? Can we get burgers and shakes? Perfect timing, said Minx as she walked over from the arena with Orion. We've been looking for you guys. I'm dying for a mint chocolate shake. Liam leaned down to whisper in my ear. That's not exactly what I had planned. He wrapped an arm around my side and pulled me in closer as the discussion around us worked out the details of the meal. I tipped my head up so my words would carry only to him. I know, me neither, but we have all weekend to sneak away. It's nice to have friends that want to hang out. I looked around the group, the casual easiness even as Orion's eyes slid over to Mary whenever she turned to a different person, then darted away when she turned in his direction. Logan maneuvered to be next to Minx as she waved Jess over. People passing by slowed and cast little glances at our boisterous group. Liam's fingers gave me a little squeeze, then dropped from my side. Let's go, people. The entire group was scattered around Mary's and my room with their bags of food and shakes. We had ordered our food to go. It wasn't just a matter of requirement since I had Moo with us, but also convenience and speed. The line for the restaurant, and every other one we passed, stretched beyond the velvety ropes and into the casino. I sucked on the straw of my shake and promised myself that tomorrow I would have a healthy breakfast. My food sat heavy in my belly, and I doubted that I could move for the next hour. We sat in a rough circle on the floor. I was next to Liam, who was running interference with Moo. Moo had his eyes locked onto our food. I leaned back against the edge of the bed. Jess, how was your afternoon? She nodded and swallowed before answering. Good. I caught up with some friends, then met with Ivana and the rest of her team from Bordistan. They're coming up to the center in about a week. 
It's going to be interesting. Her eyes cut over to Liam, then back to me. Interesting how? There's something weird going on with their national team. I couldn't get a handle on it exactly. Just little snippy comments, the way people looked at each other or phrased things. Though maybe it was just a cultural thing or language barriers? Mary flipped over her bag and dumped a few errant fries out. I wouldn't be surprised if there was drama. There's always issue with national teams because funding is involved. Even our national team's a mess. I pushed my food away before I made myself sick. Really? How so? You know how they have their own training center in Southern California? The national organization tends to pressure the tournament organizers to schedule their tournaments around when it's convenient for those athletes to compete, as opposed to the rest of the nation. I mean, they already have all their expenses paid for. Isn't that enough? Jess laughed. Mary, you have the same thing. I know, but I don't pressure anyone to change things to be convenient to me. I pondered something. Why didn't you apply to go to the National Training Center before Westmount was completed? The National Coach and I don't see eye to eye. She bit off the words before grabbing her empty food bag and crushing it in her fist with more force than necessary. I would need to ask her more about that in private, but for now, I would change the topic. I pulled the pamphlet out of my pocket and tossed it over to Jess. Have you seen this? She unfolded the paper and looked it over. I haven't seen this specifically, but I know what it's about. This comes up every year, and it ends up being a circular argument. Women want more money. People say to get more entries. Women say that the money is so low now that many archers can't afford to travel even if they win. And if they increase the payout, more women will attend. Liam stood up. I'm going to grab something from my room. I'm going to flip the door lock so I can get back in. I nodded in understanding. He grabbed Moo as I turned back to Jess. Orion extended a hand to Jess. Can I see that? Jess passed it over and continued. It isn't different from the issues I face as a female coach. People say all the best coaches are male, so they hire more male coaches. But I'll show them. I'm elbowing my way in there. Orion flipped through the pamphlet, a grim look on his face. I'm not pleased with Anderson, Maxites, Westmount Anderson, and a few other of our companies being named as companies that do not support women. That's patently untrue. We have competitive contingency plans and often promote our female shooters on social media, advertising, and in print. The theme of this year's Westmount Summit was diversity, and I did a whole speech on reaching out to and expanding our female demographic. The door to our room opened, then bounced on the door lock behind me, meaning Liam had returned. I wanted to turn, but I wanted to make the point that I had been contemplating since I read the pamphlet. But is that enough? Sure, we're talking about diversity and the value of our female clients, but are we putting our money where our mouth is? Our payouts are competitive within the industry, but if the whole industry is shortchanging women, then I'm not sure we deserve a pat on the back. What, Mary? Why are you making that face? I turned around as Moon nudged my shoulder and realized that Liam and his mother— owner of Westmount Anderson Industries, was standing next to him, thoughtfully considering what I said. She tipped her head back a little. You think that we treat our female customers unfairly? I wanted the ground to open up underneath me. A sinking feeling in my chest made the food in my belly feel like lead. I would never have said anything if I had known she was there. She was not only my boss if you went high enough up the corporate structure— but she was also a role model, a career aspiration, and Liam's mother. I, I just meant, I swallowed hard. I was just plain devil's advocate. I certainly know that I have always been treated fairly. I was so about to get fired. Jess stared at me with wide eyes, the whites visible all the way around her irises. No one else in the room stirred as Elizabeth carefully stepped through the group and sat in a chair in the corner. Her face was completely blank as she turned her eyes back to me. I imagined that I was a gazelle trapped in front of a lion as she spoke. No, I would like to hear more. I felt lightheaded as adrenaline pumped through me. I felt like I was five all over again, caught red-handed by my mom with a hand in the cookie jar. I mean, 
It says in the pamphlet that various Westmount companies donated to increase the men's payout to 100000 Doesn't that mean that we are contributing to a pay inequality? Mary shook her head at me to stop. Elizabeth tipped her head to the side slightly. None of that money comes from us directly. We allow the individual companies to choose how they spend their marketing dollars. I was warming up to the discussion and threw caution to the wind. But isn't there something Westmount Anderson can do? In people's minds, the companies are all lumped together. If Anderson Archery does something, like give a bunch of extra money to men only, then it reflects on all the companies. I hear it all the time. People use Westmount to refer to all the individual companies along with the part that you, Orion, and Liam work at. Her face was still blank. The fact that she wasn't getting angry didn't negate the fact that I was in dangerous territory. But really, I'm no expert. We have similar problems in the tech industry. She slowly replied, You seem to have done rather well in that industry. I blushed. That's true. I had a lot of advantages. But I try to make sure that my company wasn't part of the problem either. I realized that my comment could be taken as saying Westmound was part of the problem. Not that I'm saying... She cut me off as she stood. Of course not. We will discuss this later. Orion, we need to meet with you. She left before I could say anything more. Liam handed me Moo's leash and gave me a tight smile. The second he left, Mary burst out. Why? Why would you say that? What is wrong with you? I didn't know she was there, and once I started... I buried my face in my hands and wished I could roll back time. Jess got up, patted my back as she headed to the door that connected our rooms. It'll be fine, though I think you might want to hold off on asking for a promotion. Like, forever. I'm going to get ready for the opening ceremony. I got up and flopped on the bed, throwing an arm over my face. Moo crawled up next to me and rested his head across my chest. I'm going to lie here until everything's better. Minx tapped my foot as she passed. Sure, good luck with that. A few hours later, I adjusted Moo's leash to keep him close by my side as Big Bobby, the man on stage, droned on about the majesty of the Casino Cup. The crowd stirred restlessly, people bumping into me and Moo on all sides. The room was tall, but not wide enough for the people jammed in like sardines. I had never seen so many archers in one place, and I felt like I couldn't breathe deeply enough. As Big Bobby continued to wax lyrical about the importance of his contributions to the sport of archery, I tried to stifle a yawn. I scanned the crowd to find Liam again. Liam was standing by Orion and Elizabeth near the front. According to Mary, all the sponsors of the tournament would be called on stage to receive a round of applause at the end of the event. I caught Liam's eyes, as I had been doing this whole time, and smiled. He smiled back before returning his attention to the stage. A door crashed open behind me, and I turned to look. A row of 20 women marched in carrying a banner. I assumed they were women from their height and breasts, but they all had masks on over their heads, obscuring their identity. The banner stated in bold black letters, The playing field will be leveled. I grabbed Mary's arm and turned her around. Isn't that the slogan Logan told us about? People around us were starting to whisper and turn. The women at the back started chanting, We will not be ignored. Then, equal pay for equal place. Voices around us rose. Some were angry, while there were also some cheers around the room. The energy around me felt uneasy, and Moo started barking. I whispered into Mary's ear, We've got to get out of here. I weaved through the crowd toward the door with Mary at my side. The crowd surged, and as I fell through the doors, I saw that the women with their masks were gone, either unmasked or escaped. Once I was in the hallway, I started running. Mary caught up with me. Why are you running? I want Moo out of there. Crowds make him and me uneasy at the best of times. Fine, we're out of there. How about we just walk the rest of the way? We ducked around a corner and speed walked our way to the elevators. I leaned up against the cool granite tiles and tried to slow my panicky breathing. I let my head hang down as I braced my hands on my knees. I felt jittery from the adrenaline, but realizing there was no danger around us now, I forced myself to relax. What was that all about? She shrugged. Probably the same group that's handing out the pamphlets? 
An elevator door opened for us, and we had started to enter when Liam appeared at the door. His mouth set into a thin line as he snapped at me. Give me Moo. I'll bring him up afterwards. Don't go anywhere. I handed him the leash, and Moo stepped out while the door slid shut. You're in trouble, Mary sing-songed while bouncing on her toes and smiling. I grumbled a bit before replying. And I can't even narrow down what he's mad about. There was the conversation with his mother, although he had smiled at me during the opening ceremony. Maybe he had been saving his frustrations up? The elevator dinged open and we headed to our room. I stifled a yawn. Why am I so tired? Mary walked down the hallway backwards to face me while digging into her pockets until she found her room key to unlock the door. It's an hour later at home. Plus, it was a long day. I'm tired as well. Since you're grounded, let's just go to bed early. I'm not grounded, I muttered, but crossed the room to get out my pajamas and a little baggie full of items for my nighttime ritual. We puttered about the room, grabbing showers and putting on ultra-moisturizing lotion while I kept an ear open for Liam's knock. Di, can you hear me? Mary called from the bathroom where she had last been seen brushing her teeth. Yeah, what's up? I was assembling my bow and set it on the stand to be ready for the morning. I was anxious that I hadn't gotten a chance to practice, but Logan said the lines were two hours long to get into the practice room, and that would fit nowhere in our schedule. She popped her head out of the bathroom, a white clay mask on her face. I was just thinking, what if the target wasn't just Mike Champ, but the entire pro male division? That would make sense with Logan almost being hit as well, and the guys he was with getting drugged. Who has it out against that division? I rolled the idea around in my head. That makes a lot of sense on one hand, but on the other it seems crazy. What would it accomplish? The women that protested tonight were mad. Maybe they just want to punish the men for getting all the money and glory. The mask started to peel around her mouth as she talked. Bits fell off as if she was a zombie, losing flakes of skin. That means that Logan was right about being a target. Someone is trying to kill him. She flapped her hands in the air. A chunk of facial mask fell off her cheek, showing white, chalky skin that for a split second looked like bone. Or at least hurt him, she said. There was a knock on the door. I looked through the peephole to see Liam impatiently waiting in the hallway. I had the opportunity to look at him unobserved, and it took my breath away that this man I had grown so close to was also so handsome. Right now, though, he was fuming in the hallway, waiting for me to open the door. He seemed taller, more muscular, and intimidating than I remembered. I called to Mary over my shoulder. Why don't you call him and warn him a bit? Don't freak him out. He's pretty nervous already. I flipped the lock as I opened the door and greeted Liam nervously. Hey, He handed me the leash. Please don't do that again. My heart fell. I'm sorry about bringing up the money stuff in front of your mom. It wasn't. He cut me off. I mean, when you took off. Everything started to go crazy at the opening ceremony. People were pushing each other. Some fell and got hurt. I looked up and you were gone. I thought, next time, come and find me. His reaction at the elevator made more sense. He had been scared for me not mad at me. I'm sorry. I didn't. I took a deep breath and looked him in the eyes. Next time I'll come and find you. He nodded and pulled me into a hug, resting his chin on the top of my head. Moo walked between us and laid down across our feet. I smiled against his chest. So you're not mad about the money thing? Does your mom hate me now? I felt him shaking his head back and forth. She likes you fine. Promotions are probably out the window for a while, I muttered. He tightened his grip on me, and I felt a rumbling chuckle in his chest. We'll see. Three people turned the corner and speed walked down the hallway. It was Logan and Jess, with Minx prancing in her heels to keep up. She stopped, ripped the shoes off her feet, and jogged to catch up. Jess ripped her key card out of her pocket. I hate this dumb hotel. The line to get into the elevators is a mile long. Minx leaned against the wall, pulled her foot up to rub her arch. You two making out in the hallway? The door behind me popped open and Mary stuck her head out. Oh, good, 
She opened the door wide. Come on in. Minx put her shoes back on and we moved out of the hallway into our room. Mary turned around, her trusty notebook in hand. She loved Liss. Logan, did you get my text message? Logan pulled a phone from his pocket. Uh, yes, just now. You want to talk? Well, here I am. Mary picked up her notebook and flipped it open. Di and I have given it some thought, and we think that Logan's right to be worried for his safety. Our working theory is that someone is targeting the entire pro-men's compound division. That's ridiculous. Minx took off her shoes and threw them through the open door into her room. That would be mass murder. Mary held up a hand. We don't know what the goal is, but it might not be death. Could be to hurt them, punish them, possibly kill some, or just get them sick. And we aren't sure who would be behind it. But Becca said an unusually high number of people have pulled out from the division. She turned to face Logan. You might consider doing that. No way. I need that money. I deserve it. You'll figure out who is behind this in time, and until then, you'll have my back. Right, angels? He glanced at me, then turned to Minx and Mary. I sucked air through my teeth. I don't know, Logan. I'm not sure what we can do. Don't worry. I have a plan. Mary tapped her list. We'll stick together. If Logan isn't with one of us three, Minx, Di, or me, then he's with Liam, Orion, or Jess. No drinking. It'll compromise your awareness of your surroundings. No drinking or eating anything that's not sealed or prepared by the restaurants. We have two cases of bottled water. Logan is only allowed to drink that water at the tournament, and one of us will hold it at all other times. And that goes for the rest of us. And most importantly, no talking to anyone outside this room. No one. I mean it. Jess threw her hands in the air. This is ridiculous. You're not James Bond, and we're not Charlie's Angels. I'm going to bed. She left pulling the door between the two rooms closed behind her with a decisive snick. Mary pursed her lips. You'd think she'd take a bit more stock in my opinion on these things. Moo hopped up onto my bed and started circling the mattress as he prepared to lie down. It was the surest sign of my life that it was bedtime. I sat on the edge of the bed and yawned. I think she's happier pretending that none of this is happening. I need my sleep. Can you give us the rest of the instructions? Yes. Logan will come to your door to get you at 5.30. Bring your equipment. You'll stay with us and hold Moo while we shoot, then we'll do the same for you. He rubbed his forehead. That's awfully early. Why don't I come down and meet you after I get up? Mary tossed her notebook on the table where it landed with a slap. Oh, I see. You asked for our help to find the murderer, but don't want our advice. Sure, just wander down when it's convenient. I'm sure you won't get shanked in an elevator or garroted in a bathroom. Logan's hand drifted up to his neck. Liam slapped him on the back. I'll come over with you at 5.30. He gave me a wink. I smiled back at him. Logan stood up taller. You will? Okay. I mean, what else do I have to do at that time anyway? Plus, with all these guys dropping out of the tournament, my odds are just getting better and better. Mink stopped next to Logan and gave him a play punch in the arm. Maybe Logan's the murderer, and he's clearing the way for an easy victory. While the rest of us laughed, Mary tapped a pen on her teeth. Good point, Minx. She walked over to the table to scribble in her notebook. Minx looked around in confusion. Um, I was just joking. You don't think Logan could be a murderer, do you? She took half a step away. Mary shook her head. No, But someone could be eliminating the competition, or at least big chunks of competition. Wait, maybe just certain kinds of competition? Liam, the guys that took off today, were they sponsored by Westmount Companies? Liam nodded. Logan looked at Mary with wide eyes. So were Mike Champ and the guys who were drugged. Could it be a rival company? I rolled my eyes. Come on, that's silly. Mary pointed her pen at me. Someone is attacking people. That's a fact. Right now, we are considering all the possible motives. Tomorrow, everyone keep an ear open for anyone that is sick, hurt, or has any suspicious stories. After we're done shooting, I'll try to get a list of the shooters in the pro division so we can see who has and has not been messed with. 
See everyone at 5.30 sharp. Liam grabbed my hand before he left and squeezed. Chapter 5 Breakfast rolled in my stomach. I had noticed that the food was swimming with butter and grease when we had eaten, and now it alternated between sitting like a lead weight and trying to make a run for it. I swallowed hard and stared at the ugliest carpeting I had ever seen as I waited for the whistle to blow so we could head down to the target to score the arrows, return to the line, and start the next end. The rules for this tournament were mostly the same as other indoor tournaments I trained for. We shot three arrows per end, with one group going to the line and shooting, then stepping back for the second line to shoot, then everybody going to the target, scoring the arrows with four archers on the same target mat, then returning. The round consisted of 10 ends of three arrows per end for 30 arrows and a possibility of 300 points max. The difference between this tournament and the one I had shot a few weeks ago was how the groups that went up and went second alternated. I was used to alternating who went first every end, while here the same group went first for five ends, then switched. It was a minor detail, except that I had to pay constant attention to make sure I didn't miss my turn. I checked my quiver, and the top slot was empty, meaning I had already shot, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I was shooting well, and I was holding it together by the skin of my teeth. I turned around and found Liam in the crowd. Moo was laying across four chairs with his head in Liam's lap as Liam talked to another archer. A steady group of people had come by to say hi to Liam, and drop subtle hints about potential sponsorship. I had gone back to sit with him a few times, but even the polite greetings from people were a distraction to me right now. I took a slow, deep breath in, held it for a count of four, and let it out just as slowly. I had been working on my expectations and nerves since the last tournament went sideways, and I felt that I was holding it together. The whistle blew and the announcement crackled overhead, echoing around the room. That was your final end. Congratulations. My head jerked around in surprise, and the instructions continued overhead. How had I not noticed we were done? Mary bounded over to me. Her arm guard, finger tab, and chest protector were already removed and hung from her quiver. How'd you do? My target had been far enough away from her that except for the occasional thumbs up when we caught each other's eyes, I hadn't seen her since we arrived for practice. I... I don't know. Okay, I think? I made the best possible shots I could in the moment, but I didn't realize we were done. I have no idea what my score is. The fact that we were done shooting for the day was sinking in, causing the adrenaline that had been pumping through my body since I woke up to trickle away. I felt like a wet noodle. She chuckled at me. You were calling arrows? When I nodded back, she gave me a knowing smile and skipped away to her target. For this tournament... Each target had three people recording the score, two on paper and one into the handheld electronic receiver. Those scores were updated after every end, meaning anyone looking at the monitors throughout the venue or on the internet could see the scores in real time. The remaining person's job was to call, or recite out loud, the value of the arrow of the four competitors on each mat. I had called the arrows on my target and, as such, had no clue what end it was. I was sure there were one or two ends left. I shook my head and realized that my target mates were waiting for me to finish up. By the time we finished scoring, filled in the appropriate boxes, and signed the scorecards, the hall had filled up with the next group that would shoot. People pressed close as our group attempted to leave and the next group attempted to occupy the exact same space. Jess bounded up to me and threw her arms around my neck. I'm so, so proud of you. Your shots looked amazing. I got some video to look at when you get home. How are you feeling? Uh, fine. Tired, I guess. I scanned the crowd for Liam and Moo. I found Marion Logan walking toward me instead. Why? You shot a new personal best and you feel fine? I know we were focusing on form and execution over outcome, but you can be a little happy. I what? I flipped over my scorecard to look. Then I looked again. Sure enough, it was a new personal best. Well, I'll be. That's pretty cool. I had no idea. An unexpected feeling of joy and accomplishment welled up inside me. 
I looked at it again, tracing each number over with my eyes. Logan slapped me on the back. Good job, Di. Mary hugged me. I'm so proud of you. You shot great today. What? How do you guys know? I hadn't even known, and I shot the round. Mary stepped back and balanced the bottom limb of her bow on her toe while she took off the long stabilizer that stuck out front. Liam told Logan before he took Moo out to go to the bathroom. After we turn in our scorecards, we're supposed to go find him. I grabbed my bow off the rack and unscrewed the stabilizer. How did he know? Logan chuckled and stepped closer as people pushed past him to hang their equipment in the empty spots of the bow rack. He used your binoculars to watch every shot and had the scores pulled up the whole time. He didn't want you to see it in case it made you nervous. My stomach flipped. Let's get out of here. We weaved through the throng of people into the wide hallway outside. Activity bustled around, and I followed Mary as she got in line. She knew the person ahead of her, so I contentedly listened to her conversation with the man. He was asking about her custom bow and what equipment she used and why. When my turn came, I presented my scorecards to the lady behind the table, only to realize it was Becca. Hi, Becca. Oh, hi, Di. How'd it go today? She ran two fingers over the cards, comparing the values and matching boxes to make sure the cards were in agreement. Good, how about you? She stamped one card and handed it back. Busy, busy. The person behind me stepped to the table and I walked away trying to spot Mary. I spotted her walking with Unk and Logan toward the main shooting venue, the arena beyond the trade show. I started to follow, but as I caught sight of Liam and Moo, I changed directions. Liam was hugging a wall far enough away from the shooting hall entrance, bathroom, bar, and lines to have a bit of open space. As I approached, Moo rushed forward to greet me. Liam extended a hand toward my bow and quiver. I passed them both over so I could greet Moo properly, with scratches and a kiss on the soft fur under his ear. I stood up and smiled at Liam, but before I could say anything, Orion joined us. You ready? Orion ducked as a bow limb cut through the space where his head had been a second ago. I turned to him. Ready for what? To meet Elizabeth. Uh, Where's Mary? I was going to ask her how she shot. He looked around the crowd. I decided it wouldn't hurt to nudge things a little. I'm not sure how she shot. I think she's watching the pro men shooting in the arena next. I saw her walking that way with Unk. His head jerked back to me. Unk? Like, Uncle Mike? Mike Uncalis? Yeah, that's him. He's probably trying to convince her to go on a date again. Orion's eyes narrowed a little, then drifted toward the arena. I pressed my lips together to avoid smiling as I watched his internal struggle. It would be kinder to mention that Logan was with him, but I let him stew on the choice he had made. Did you say we were meeting Elizabeth? Orion dragged his attention back to me. Uh, Yes, come on. We managed to grab an empty office down this way. I turned back to Liam. Are you coming? He shook his head. I swallowed hard at the idea of having a private meeting with Orion and Elizabeth. Was I going to get a formal warning? They wouldn't fire me, would they? Liam handed me Moo's leash. Moo can go with you for moral support. I'll put your bow in the Anderson booth. I nodded to Liam, then Orion, and said a silent prayer as I followed Orion down the hallway. We passed where I had been competing and continued down the hall toward the pet area we had used yesterday. Moo was tugging on the leash to go outside when Orion stopped at a door propped open with a trash can. It was next door to the tournament office. I nodded to Becca as she passed. The room wasn't particularly small, but someone had placed banquet tables around the perimeter and one in the middle of the room. Once Orion shut the door, the cramped space felt even smaller. Elizabeth sat on the opposite side of the middle table. I took a deep, slow breath as I sat opposite Elizabeth. Her face was smooth and unreadable. She was cool, a little distant, but not angry. I've given considerable thought to what you said yesterday about women's payout. We've discussed it, and we have a proposition. Her use of the word proposition was all that kept me from flinging myself out of the chair and begging for forgiveness. The single word gave me hope. I nodded. First off, no one knows about this except me and Orion. Not even Liam knows the full extent, so there is no pressure for you to commit. If you decline, as you should if you aren't committed, then no one will ever know. 
my fear and trepidation were diminishing in the rising curiosity. I understand. I didn't fully yet. We can offer an additional 5000 for the Pro Women's Compound Division for payout, regardless of who wins, and we can double the contingency payout in that division for any shooter that receives a check from a company owned by Westmount Anderson Industries. My mouth fell open in surprise. So if they get 3000 from Anderson and 1000 from Knight Accessories for 4000 then you'll give them another 4000 in contingency money? She nodded. Yes, they'll get an additional check for 4000 from Westmount Anderson directly from our new Advancement of Female Archers campaign. Wow, that would be great. That is a big difference in payout. They're going to be thrilled. I smiled at Orion, but he didn't smile back. Hold on, Di. Right now, this is just a proposed idea based on you doing your part. I looked between them as I realized the other shoe was about to drop. Okay, and that is... We can't just give money away. We also can't single-handedly try to fix the pay inequality in the industry. This would be an investment with the expectation that over time, the AFA campaign, as we're calling it, would pay for itself through an increase in sales to female archers, and that would be your job. I felt sure that I had missed something. What would be my job? You would need to run the AFA, decide the tournaments where we would raise the payout, figure out matching contingency, advertising, set up social media for it, get women to interview, basically make the thing work. My eyes went wide at the extent of the project ran through my head. I don't have that kind of training. That's Orion's job. He should do it. She shook her head. He has a full-time job. This project would fall under his umbrella, but you would do the work. He gave me a little smile. I think you could do it. You ask the right questions. Your focus is in the right places. We could have some meetings this week, and I would always be a phone call away to guide you. But I slowed down to think. This was important to me, and they were giving me an option to help improve the situation. Why not someone like Logan? He worked for Anderson Archery, doing a lot of this already. They already have their budget set for the year. And once again, Logan already has a full-time job. This is going to take a minimum of 20 hours a week, we think. I called Robbie at the center, and he told me that since the center is no longer in the setup stage, you have that extra 20 hours within your work week. We didn't tell him why, but he's confident that many of your daily tasks can and should be shifted over to the department heads at the center. But the biggest reason we want Westmount Anderson Industries to be directly in charge of this project through you is because of the point you made. Our brand is so tightly enmeshed that it makes sense to have us lead the way rather than trying to force a dozen smaller companies to create, implement, and advertise on their own. I sat back and let everything sink in. The amount of power Elizabeth was offering me was scary, but close on the heels of fear were excitement and eagerness. It was a big project that could lead to big changes. It could positively impact the community that had embraced me. Plus, my geeky heart sang at the thought of all the charts and spreadsheets I could make. My voice was confident. What kind of timeline are we talking about? A smile peeked around Elizabeth's mouth. She knew she had me hooked. Outdoor season, which both the national circuit and 3D season starts within a month. So we need to get a strong plan to Orion within a week so he can review it and spend a week with you tweaking it. It would need to be announced within two weeks. If we wait much longer, we risk not getting a return at all this year. A week? I need to learn everything in a week? I don't think that is possible. If I take 20 hours of the work week and all my evenings and free time, I don't think I could do it. My heart fell in my chest. I couldn't take on a project knowing I would fail and the opportunity was slipping through my fingers. You could use basically all 40 hours of your work week for the next two weeks. Robbie said he could do that so long as you're available to answer questions. He says that you have that place so automated that it basically runs itself. I rubbed my chin. I might be able to do it, but the biggest issue would be trying to grab the nuances of the sport. There were numbers on one hand, but also perceptions. I needed an expert. Can I have Mary to help me? Orion started to protest, but I spoke quickly to explain. 
She has knowledge in this industry as both an athlete and a journalist that I might never learn. I might be able to pull up the attendance for different events, but she knows off the top of her head that Tournament A has more room for growth than B because of field layout or that costs are too high. I know she would love to help out. I think she could add to the project. And honestly, I don't know if I can pull anything together in a week without some help. I mean, I'm not even sure I understand what you want in a week. But I knew that I wanted to do it. Orion looked at Elizabeth and nodded. She nodded back in agreement. You made your point. Assuming that she's okay with it, I'll call Robbie today and see what we can work out. For now, we're only announcing this single event increase of 5000 and double contingency. We'll announce your new position and try to introduce you to our pro staff manager and marketers this week so you can set up meetings with them. I'm sure they'll be excited to share the information with their shooters. Oh? She chuckled. More money for their shooters that they don't have to spend? Win-win. My palms were sweaty. I was taking in a lot of extra responsibility, but I was excited. Moo leaped up and joined me as I stood. Orion was typing in his phone, and Elizabeth stepped closer for a private moment. I know that I said that you could turn down the offer with no repercussions, but personally, I'm really proud to see you step up to the challenge. She squeezed my shoulder and left the room. Orion put his phone back in his pocket and smiled. How you doing? You were pretty pale when we walked in. Why didn't you tell me on the way over that it was good news? I thought you two might be firing me. I fanned my face. It wasn't even noon and I was ready for a nap. He laughed out loud. I'm not totally convinced this was good news. It's going to be a ton of work and people will criticize you every step of the way. But we have faith in you. I've got to take off. I have another meeting, but grab me later and I'll introduce you with your new title. He left before I could ask what my official title was. In the room alone, I took a moment to look around before I left. There was a printer, coffee pots, trays of food, and stacks of paper everywhere. With the rise of the internet, people kept predicting that everyone would go paperless at any moment. And yet it hadn't happened. Come on, Moo. Moo danced at the end of his lead, excited to hear his name, and his thick tail swept across the table, knocking over a box of paper onto the floor. The box landed on its side and loose paper fanned across the room. I sighed and grabbed the box off the ground. There was a black marker note on the side that indicated that the papers inside were headed for the shredder. The pages nearest my feet were target assignments for this morning's line. The printer must have been low on ink because the words were faded. I crouched down and gathered the papers until my eyes landed on some financial pages. I randomly flipped through the rest of the pages underneath, which included payouts, entry numbers, and lists of participants. Bingo. I took off my thin jacket and grabbed all the papers from the financial sheets down, then wrapped the jacket around it. I clutched it to my chest and peeked out the door before racing into the hallway. Moo pulled to greet people that extended their hands, but I pulled him in closer. Nodding at a few people I recognized as I passed, I looked over my shoulder back at the room. A cleaning crew was entering the room, and I blew out a sigh of relief that no one was chasing after me. There was probably nothing of value in the stacks of paper, but I didn't want to explain why I had grabbed them. Tiger held out a hand in front of me. Hey, Di, let me introduce you to Esther and Georgiana. I greeted two little blondes with southern accents. Nice to meet you. Did you shoot already? They nodded, the little blonde explained. It didn't go so well for either of us, but Tiger offered to look over our equipment at the practice range. They gazed up at him adoringly, and he gave me a wink, then looked past me. Florine, did you want to join us? A red-headed gal joined him with her bow. I chuckled. I'll let you go then. Good luck to all of you. I couldn't help but smile at Tiger as he headed to the practice range with the three girls. Entering the trade show, I had to slow down. The booths were still surrounded, and even more people had bows today than yesterday. Once I made it through the booths to the top of the arena seating, I scanned the crowd. The bottom row of the seating was about 10 feet higher than the arena floor, but there were portable rolling stairways at the bottom of each aisle that you could use to get to the arena floor. More chairs were at the bottom, then a row of tables that separated the row of chairs from the shooters. Scanning the archer's seating area, I spotted Logan's tall frame. Then glancing around behind the tables, I found Mary with her smooth black bob. 
I started walking down the cement stairs, but Moo hesitated. He carefully sniffed the stairs, then walked his front paws down several stairs, then paused, and finally lifted his back paws to join the front. Come on, Moo, you know how to walk downstairs. Come on! He lifted his head to stare at me, his jowls flopping side to side as he shook his head, then lowered it to inspect the next few stairs. Slowly, we inched our way down the arena. Step, 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 pause. Step, 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 pause. People giggled and pointed, while a few snapped pictures. Moo was a large and clumsy dog, so I let him take his time. When we got to the base of the arena stairs, we had to step up and onto the black metal stairs that had been rolled into the arena. I had stepped up and started down when Moo jerked me back. He was edging away from the metal stairs and sat down. Come on, Moo. It's okay. People watched us, and my cheeks flamed up in embarrassment. The practice session was about to start, and people were milling about. A few of the pro-male compounders were watching us as I begged Moo to continue. He extended his front feet onto the platform at the top of the black stairs, but his rear legs refused to budge. I begged and pleaded in a whisper for him to move. He extended his front paws to the top stairs, his belly resting across the entire platform but his back paws stayed. Come on, be a big boy. Moo responded with a dramatic moan. He wasn't in pain. It was a noise he reserved for moments when he didn't want to do what I asked him, like get off the bed or take a bath. I pulled a little more and he raised his head and let loose with a long groan of displeasure. Heads whipped around at the noise. It was not worth the embarrassment. I looked at the stands and at least half of the people were watching. I went back over the platform and started up the cement stairs. Okay, you win this time. Moo didn't budge, but looked over his shoulder at me and whined. I think your dog's stuck. I leaned to the left to see a couple of the male archers were at the bottom of the metal stairs. Two of them had Anderson jerseys on, which made my embarrassment both more and less. He's just being a big baby. I picked up his back feet and wrestled with the weight to get them back under his belly. Moo was docile and did nothing to help me as I maneuvered his feet. Then I squeezed by him and started down the stairs. I tried to pull him down. When he lifted his right front paw, I was ecstatic. Until he placed it over my shoulder and started leaning onto me. No, no, down, Moo, down! I reached up for his right paw, and he placed his left paw on my other shoulder and pushed his chest to mine. He lifted his snout and let out a long cry that reminded me of a dying bagpipe. I reached out for the railing, steadying myself with one hand while clutching the packet of papers with the other. He let out another whine and rested his head on his paws as my knees started to buckle under his immense furry weight. Mary's voice called up for me on the floor of the arena. What are you doing? Help, Mary, take this. I tried to reach down with the jacket wrap stack of paper. Please, hurry! A hand took the bundle from my arm, and I grabbed the railing as Moo continued to moan and whine his angst. Everyone is staring, Di. Mary sounded disapproving. They're about to start practice. You think I'm doing this for fun? Help me! I'm stuck! Moo was resting his chin on the top of my head as he carried on, and all I could see was black and white fur. A voice I didn't recognize called out. Ma'am, you can't block the aisle way. It's against fire code. I had dog hair in my nose and no clue how I was going to get out of this when someone came up behind me and reached around to grab Moo's chest. Logan's voice was loud in my ear. You ready, Liam? One, two, three. Moo was lifted off of me and I could see that Logan had the front half of Moo while Liam was carrying the back half down the stairs past me. Moo lifted up his head and gave out a long howl as thunderous applause went up all over the arena. Every eye in the arena, stands, and on the shooting floor was on us. I wanted to curl up and die, but gave a little wave, then joined Moo as he pranced on the floor, no worse for his little act. I followed Mary over to seats she had reserved for us. A security guard approached with a stern face. Next time, go through there and use the elevator. He pointed to a curtained-off entrance at the side of the shooting lanes. Unk called out, Nice floor show, Di. Looking forward to seeing the second act. Liam searched out my hand. 
I smiled up at him, and a warm happiness settled in my chest that pushed out the last bits of embarrassment. I thought you were pretty adorable, he said as he slid a stray lock of hair behind my ear. Chapter 6 The whistle blew, and the male compound shooter started practice. The thumps of arrows hitting the target mat added to the general buzz of people talking through the arena and trade show. Mary sat next to Meeks. I took the next seat, and Liam grabbed the aisle. He settled Moo down next to him. Meeks leaned forward to look around Mary. Hey, princess, pull yourself together. You're giving the Westmount Training Center a bad name. I rolled my eyes at her for using the nickname I hated and for her comment. She chuckled, sat back, and lifted her binoculars. Then she gave a little wave to someone. I followed her line of sight to see Lucky smiling at her, and I gave a second eye roll, like she had any right to say anything. I saw that, Minx leaned across Mary. After they're done shooting, we're all going to go hang out at the bar. He told me right before this that his friends know he's getting a divorce, though no one is talking about it until it's public. So we're going to hang out as a group. I don't want to hang out at the bar, I whispered back. Yes, you do, because you love me. Please, you'll come, Mary, right? Mary and I exchanged a look, then I sighed. Fine, for a bit. She squealed and leaned back in her seat. Mary chuckled and unwrapped the stack of papers. What is this? I leaned over and blocked the papers from being seen by others. I met with Orion and Elizabeth in a room that the tournament staff uses. After they left, Moo knocked over a box of papers, and some of them looked really interesting, so I grabbed some of them. Can you put them in your backpack for us to look over later? She flipped through them, then shoved the crumpled printouts into her backpack. What's on them? I shrugged. I didn't get a chance to see, but I know there were some with financial information and division registration. She nodded. Maybe we'll find something useful in there. Why did Orion and Elizabeth want to meet? You're not in trouble, are you? She spoke softly, ready to console me if I needed it. I had forgotten to tell her. Grabbing her arm in excitement, I shared the news. They offered me the opportunity to work on a campaign for women in archery, and you get a help! I shared all the information and realized how much information I didn't have as Mary peppered me with questions about implementation of the program. It made me uneasy. Maybe they had made the wrong decision in offering me this position and opportunity. Liam laid a hand on my arm, and I turned back to him. You'll do great. My anxiety settled down. You'll help me? He nodded and squeezed my arm again before turning his attention back to the archers. Suddenly, halfway through the shooting time, the light started to flash and a siren went off. Lucky brought over my glass of water at the bar while filling in Mary and me on what happened. The fire alarm kept going off. They only evacuated us that one time, but it was still a huge mess. Mink sauntered over, her hips swaying left and right with her drink in hand. I can't believe you were able to shoot clean with all those distractions. He gave a smarmy smile to Minx and leaned in closer. Only 20 X's, well below my normal count, but good enough. It helped to have my own cheering section, sweetie. If he shot clean, that meant every arrow was within the 10 ring for the highest possible score per arrow of 10 points. The X ring was half as big as the 10 ring and still worth 10 points, but many archers listed the X count to indicate how many of the arrows were in the center versus catching the edge of the 10 ring. They stood smiling at each other until I had to say something. Sorry we didn't stay. Moo was upset, so we left. Minx had offered to stay with Logan and protect him, though her motives were a bit mixed since she had kept her eyes on Lucky up to that point. Mary and I had taken Moo out to go to the bathroom, then picked up our bows and quivers to drop them off in the room, along with the wad of papers. Liam had meetings and offered to take Moo with him, leaving Mary and me free to grab lunch and hang out at the bar for a bit. I was happy to let Liam take Moo. My ego stung from the embarrassing scene he had caused. I told Moo sternly that he needed to go think about what he had done. I even threatened to make him sleep in Liam's room. Liam hadn't walked more than a dozen feet away before I chased after him to hug Moo and tell him that I still loved him. He had me wrapped around his paw for sure. 
I turned around with a grimace as I spotted Moose approaching. Die, congratulations are in order. He slapped my back with a beefy hand that knocked me off balance. Moose, I wasn't. No need to say anything, he winked. I let out a sigh and gave up. He thought he knew it all, and no explanation would prove otherwise. In a way, he had been right, and that chapped my hide. He stepped to the side and introduced me to three female archers. I want you to meet some of the athletes I represent. This is Tone, Pris, and Batter. The ladies were of various heights and sizes, which was common for archery. Archers came in all shapes, some tall and lean, and others short and stouter. As I listened to each lady list which Westmount sponsors she shot for, Minx and Lucky peeled away to move closer to the bar. They stood closer and gazed into each other's eyes. Their voices were lost in the bells and beeps of the slot machines around us and the cheers from the craps table, but their body language was loud and clear as they flirted. She looked up at him through her eyelashes and had precious little smiles. He had his chest puffed out and loudly gestured around. The ladies finished their shooting resumes, and I asked the questions you had to ask every archer at a tournament. How did you guys shoot today? It was rare to hear anyone give a positive answer to that question. The answers ranged from negative, where they convinced you that they were much better archers than their scores, to modest answers that it went okay, even if they broke a world record. Someone should do a study on the culture of how archers describe their scores. They nodded in response to the question and made noncommittal noises, implying neither great nor awful. Batter was the only one to vocalize her thoughts. Not too bad, not too bad. I'm just glad we weren't shooting in the arena. Normally I complain that the pro men get the arena and the pro women get stuck in the back room, but not today. Have you seen the scores? She gave a long whistle. Mary perked up. No, we haven't. How many are still clean? Shooting clean meant a perfect 300 score. Over three days, that would equal 900 and qualify those shooters to the shoot-off for $100,000. Batter leaned forward, her large cleavage shifting in her shooter's jersey. Fifteen. Can you believe it? Mary gasped. Fifteen? Are you for real? I looked between them. I was missing some sense of the importance of this information. Mary caught my eye and filled me in as she always did. Normally there are 90 to 150 guys clean at this point. By the end, there might be 13 to 50 with a perfect 900, but I have never, ever heard of them being down to only 15 after the first day. It wasn't an accident, said Pris, a tiny lady with a high squeaky voice. Mary's face crinkled up. What wasn't an accident? The fire alarm. When I left the venue, I was behind two maintenance guys, and I heard them say that someone had tampered with it. Mary and I exchanged a smirk and nod. Clues. Really? What else did they say? Mary smoothly asked. That's all I heard. The guy was talking loudly. He was pissed that he missed his lunch break. The other guy hushed him, then they went into a maintenance room. Why would someone mess with the fire alarm? Oh boy, Moose said. He was looking over our heads toward the entrance of the casinos. This is going to be a scene. I turned around and looked for anyone or thing out of place. The only thing was a lady with red hair who was very pregnant and dragging a rolling bag behind her. Is that Katie, Lucky's wife? Batter asked. Oh no. I stepped toward the bar to tell Minx that Lucky's soon-to-be ex-wife was here and might not be so exy. But the gal, Katie, reached them first, and her voice carried across the casino. Get away from my husband, you hussy! Katie grabbed Minx by the shoulder and pulled her away from Lucky. Minx reared around. He told me he was divorcing you, and don't you call me a hussy! Mary and I reached Minx. I wedged myself in between our friend and the redhead. Minx had a temper, and no one needed a fight with a pregnant lady. Hey now, I think this anger is misplaced. Lucky is the one saying that he's almost divorced. Katie gestured to her stomach. Does this look like we're getting a divorce? I'm about to have his baby. I wasn't here because of work, but they gave me the day off at the last minute. I came out here to surprise Lucky, but I didn't expect for women to throw themselves at him. Turn around is fair play, eh, Katie? A voice said behind me. 
I stepped aside to see that Pinky had joined us. I grabbed Minx's arm and pushed her out of the way. Pinky stepped up and confronted Katie in the space we had left. Pinky jabbed a finger at Katie. Don't try to act so high and mighty when you got knocked up while Lucky was living with me. Minx tore her arm out of my grasp to address Pinky. You dated Lucky? Yeah, I dated him for a year. We were living together when suddenly him and Katie eloped because she was pregnant. Pinky glared at Katie while Minx looked between them. Mary whispered in my ear, Notice something about Minx, Pinky, and Katie? The three gals stood next to each other, arguing about who did what, when, and why. They were all roughly the same age and height, with similar haircuts and hair ranging in the red to pink color family. Oh my gosh, they look alike. I started giggling. Minx glared at me, and Katie and Pinky followed suit. Katie put her hands on her hips. What are you laughing at? Clearly Lucky has a type. Mary snorted next to me. I tried to stop laughing as the three narrowed their eyes at me in unison. Oh, come on, look at you three. It's like central casting called for redheads with fiery personalities. A crowd was gathering around and they seemed to see the humor in the situation, even if those involved didn't. I turned to Moose and a few faces I recognized. Why didn't anyone warn us? We, I gestured to Minx, Mary, and myself, thought he was practically divorced. Batter shrugged. We figured you knew. Everyone in 3D knows how lucky is. My eyebrows shot up. We didn't know. We aren't 3D shooters. Next time, you tell us. She chuckled. You'll be the first to know. My fondness for her grew. I was slowly easing into the archery community and discovering more people I liked. There was something appealing about someone who was willing to go along with your jokes or requests. Maybe it was my new position that was already well known, but I hoped that it was just the age-old action of people making friends. I grabbed Minx one last time. Come on, Minx. He lied to you about a situation and you don't owe any more explanation than that. She gave him one last glare and snatched my glass of water from my hand to toss the remaining bit in his face. He sputtered and shouted as water dripped off his face and shirt. Minx turned back to me. Now I'm ready. I let out a sigh and walked through the casino to a different bar 20 yards away. The bars were identical even down to the group of archers drinking away their bad shots. Batter followed us over and pointed to the row of men in their shooter jerseys, sitting morosely and drinking in silence. The 299 Club. These would be the archers that dropped a point and were out of the shootoff on Sunday no matter how well they shot the rest of the weekend. Lucky was wiping his face off with a napkin at the other bar while Pinky and Katie gestured at each other. The group that had watched the fight trailed behind us as they came over to the new bar. Unk appeared next to Mary with a glass he offered to her. I know you aren't drinking, so I got you some soda. She turned to him with a smile on her face. Thank you, Unk. How did you shoot? Clean. And I saw that you shot pretty well yourself. He edged in a bit closer to her. I stepped away, giving them a chance to talk, and checked on Minx. She was sulking and sucking on her drink. Hey, Minx. You doing okay? She reared around on me, tears building in her eyes. What's wrong with me? Minx and I butted heads like sisters, and in the same way my heart broke for her. I wrapped my arms around her. Nothing is wrong with you. She flopped her forehead on my shoulder. Why do I have such bad luck and love? I rolled my eyes. You have pretty awful taste in guys. That I can't deny. But you're hardly alone in that. If you want help, maybe you could listen to marry me when we warn you? She grumbled into my shirt. Well, you're getting a divorce. I grimaced and grabbed her shoulders to look her in the eye. Do you want sympathy or a smack in the head? She rolled her eyes and finished her drink. Hey, Orion. I smiled at him in greeting. He started to smile, then his eyes skipped past me to the bar, and the smile faded. Mary and Unk were at the bar talking. Smug satisfaction rolled over me. My earlier mention of Unk hitting on Mary was paying off as Orion focused on them, a visible scowl on his face. He tore his eyes off them and faced me. Di, I was thinking that you might want to come around and meet the people at our companies that you'll be working on this project with. Sure, 
are these people I met at the Westmount Summit? Mostly. Plus, we can talk with them about the program. It's always nice to brainstorm in person. He cast a glance back to Mary and Unc. Should we bring Mary along? No. She should catch up with her friends. Come on, let's go. I flopped onto my bed face down and mumbled into the cover. Di, I can't hear a thing you're saying. I sat up. I said that I am so exhausted I might sleep like this. How was your afternoon? I had finally gotten back to our room a few minutes ago to find Mary already there. Fun! I tried to cheer up Minx a little. We all went out to an early dinner. The tips of her ears tinged pink. Who is we all? She turned back to me and folded the clothing that was spread out around her suitcase. Just some people at the bar. She folded a pair of pants, smoothed out the fabric, and set it down. Just some people, eh? Did these people include a certain Uncle Mike? I teased. She picked up the same pair and refolded them. Oh, him. Yeah, I guess he was there. You guess. She turned around and glared. Why are you giving me such a hard time? I laughed. I'm just teasing you. You tease me all the time about Liam. She chuckled. Fine, you win. Yes, Unc ate with us and was a total gentleman, but before you ask, no. No what? No, I don't like him, and I won't date him. But it's flattering all the same. I debated telling her about the way Orion watched her talk to Unc, but decided against it. It didn't mean anything until it did. I know what you mean. What about your day? I didn't even see you leave. You were having fun, and I didn't want to interrupt. I sat up, dug into my pocket, and pulled out a handful of business cards. I met everyone, talked to everyone, and listened to everyone. I'm exhausted. I'm so glad Liam was there to deflect the questions that I had no answers to. The name, Advancement of Female Archers, was too long to repeat, so we're calling it AFA. Catchy! Next week is going to suck for you. You have so much work. I know. I had so looked forward to having Liam back at the center. I'd imagined long evenings spent together, but now it appeared that every second of my existence would be devoted to this project if I was going to have a prototype ready for Orion the following week. But at least Liam would be back at the center for the foreseeable future. Did you hang out with Unc all day? She shook her head. After dinner, I came back and wrote a quick article about the Casino Cup. She went over to the small round table in the corner of the room and pulled her computer around in front of her. I dug through the papers you stole while I was at it. Some very useful numbers in there. I had forgotten all about them until now. Really? Do tell. She pointed to some piles of paper on the table that I hadn't noticed. I broke them into groups. This is stuff that isn't important, just some target assignments and equipment lists are set up. I'm keeping them in case we think of a reason to look at them. But these are what you should look at. I got up and moved over to the table, grabbing the second chair. This pile? I picked up a few pieces of paper with lists of dollar amounts. That is a list of who donated what, so the payout for men can be 100000 It looks like 25000 is the standard payout, so this list is where the other 75000 came from. I scanned the list and found Westmount listed for 10000 along with 5000 from Anderson Archery. I ran down the list, finding the companies owned by Anderson and adding up the numbers. 30000 total? Wow! It was frustrating that they could donate so much money to make a big prize even bigger. It made my job with AFA even more important, and for the first time I realized the scope of what I was doing. Toxo Sports, another big company that owns lots of archery companies, donated 25000 The remaining twenty was spread out among a ton of little companies. No idea what that means, but there you have it. I put the stack down. Next to it was a single sheet of paper. That is the divisions and number of entries in each. I compared it to what's listed online. Most of the divisions lost a handful of people, but the pro-male compound division lost 40 archers between when that list was printed on Wednesday and what's online today. Wow, I didn't realize that many guys dropped out. And this last stack? I picked it up to start flipping through. Rules. 
a full set of rules for this tournament. We're going to read it front to back. I put the stack down on the table. Oh, I don't know if that's necessary. I started to rise. Sit. I'll take this half, and you start with that. Afterwards, we'll switch. I groaned and took my half over to the bed. When there was a knock on the door later, I leaped up from the bed. I'll get it! I was saved from reading more about the length of stabilizers allowed in each class. I threw open the door to see Liam with Moo. Moo! I grabbed his leash and rubbed his neck. The number of times I had instinctively looked for him only to remember he wasn't around had done my head in. I pulled him into the room and unhooked his leash. He went straight for the bed. I flipped the lock on the door and stepped into the hallway. Hi to you too. I looked up at Liam. He might not be my constant companion, but I had caught myself searching the crowd for his tall, lean frame as well. He wrapped his arms around me. I wasn't sure if you even spotted me on the other end of Moo's leash. I laced my arms around his waist and leaned into his warm chest. Always. Did you and Orion get a lot of work done? We talked to everyone. I can do this. He squeezed my shoulder. You'll be fine. Mary came to the door. Liam, I have this for you. Indy asked us to give it to you. She handed him a DVD. Liam flipped it over. Thanks. Whenever you guys get up tomorrow, why don't you swing by the Anderson Archery booth and talk to some customers? Great idea. We still on for Valentine's dinner? He gave me a wink before leaving. Looking forward to it. The trade show was loud and the sound was giving me a headache. I checked the time again to confirm we didn't need to leave the Anderson booth yet. We had slept in and had a leisurely brunch, then came over to the trade show to talk to customers. And by that, I meant Mary would talk to customers while I tried to give non-exact answers to the pros that came by to ask about payouts for the rest of the tournament season. I must have said, that information will be available within the next few weeks, approximately 1,000 times. Mary was busy discussing with another archer the way the new risers flexed versus the old ones when I saw Tiger approaching with, Surprise, surprise, a gang of females. Die, let me introduce you to Christy, Jacqueline, Mandy, Eileen, and Hannah. Did you hear about the betting? I smiled at the gals before replying. What are you talking about? Big Bobby's super pissed. That was supposed to be one of the big draws of the tournament this year, that there was sanctioned betting on the shoot-off, but the casino pulled the whole thing because they said someone is trying to fix the matches. So Mary Logan and I weren't the only ones that thought something fishy was going on. Have they brought the police in? He shrugged. Who knows? You need to eat? We're about to grab something for lunch. He was already turning away as I called. We're good. Have fun. Mary finished up with the customer's question and joined me. What did Tiger say? The casino pulled the bets on the tournament. She nodded. Because of all the accidents, right? I'm not surprised. There is obviously something dangerous going on. I searched the booth. We really need to stay close to Logan today. Chapter 7 I pulled my jacket tight around me as the Vegas wind whipped it around. The taxi queue was short in front of our casino, but I still shivered while we waited. Liam took off his jacket and held it out to me. Do you want my jacket? No, I'll be okay. I scooted in close next to him where he blocked the wind. The day had raced by. Mary and I kept a close eye on Logan through our shooting time and his. Unlike yesterday's fire alarm disaster, today had gone according to plan. No errant vans trying to run Logan over, no spiked drinks, nothing. We had given him strict instructions not to eat or drink anything at the Casino Cup Gala. Minx would be by his side along with Moo. The remaining archers that were clean would be called up on stage in the arena. Then, instead of drinking and mingling at the event, Minx and Logan were going to grab hamburgers and shakes and go back to the rooms with Moo until Mary, Orion, Liam, and I returned. Mary and Orion were behind us quietly talking. I had feared that it would be an awkward evening But since Orion and Liam met us at our room, we had separated into groups. Our taxi pulled up, a minivan, 
and Liam sat in the far back bench. I scooted in next to him and he pulled me close with an arm. Orion gave the driver directions as I turned to quietly talk to Liam. How was your day? Good. Meetings. How was shooting? I'm sorry I couldn't make it over. I understand. Did the meetings go okay? He nodded and I continued. I shot well, got off to a bit of a rocky start, but pulled it together by the end. I'll say you were up one point from yesterday. Snuck a little glance at the scores, did ya? Of course. He squeezed my shoulder, the heat of his hand soaking through my jacket. I briefly rested my head on his shoulder. I wanted to just enjoy being so close to him, but it fought with my desire to tell him every little detail of my day. My need to communicate one. I really got into my groove today. I focused on keeping movement throughout the shot and aggressive execution. I had some great shots. Then we went and watched Log and Shoot. Nothing weird happened today, and he's still clean. I saw. His hand was lazily drawing circles on my shoulder as I kept talking. They canceled the betting. I mean, the casino. I didn't even get a chance to check it out. Was it for all divisions or just pro compound men? Just the men's division. It was a trial. They had the attendees listed with odds of making it into the shoot-off and winning. They also had another bet for number of shooters in the shoot-off. I didn't pay much attention. It would be tough to win because there are a couple dozen guys who could take the whole thing on any given day. Who do you think will win out of the five that are still clean? Logan could take it. He's shooting as well as he did last year. Lucky's won several times. He could do it again. Who else was clean? Mary turned around in her seat. Unk is... Orion studied Mary's face as our taxi pulled onto the Vegas Strip, the bright marquees and headlights from the heavy traffic illuminating their faces. He had been very attentive this evening. When Mary said Unk's name, his eyes narrowed slightly. She looked at him and smiled, and he returned it quickly, the wariness disappearing from his face. The taxi pulled into the driveway of a fancy casino known for its dining options. After the bill was paid and we entered the casino, I continued the conversation. That's three of them. Who are the other two? I had heard their names, but since I hadn't met them personally, they had slipped right out of my mind. Mary was next to me and replied, Fox and Rue, like kangaroo? One from Canada and the other from Australia. I'll let you guess which is which. She stepped in closer and lowered her voice. You know, Unk, Lucky, Fox, and Rue might be our strongest suspects. They have the most to gain from eliminating the competition. I nodded. Good idea. When we get home tonight, we'll look into it. But for now... I stepped away from her and raised my voice. Where are we eating? Liam looked around. It should be... there. This way, ladies. We strode over to an Italian restaurant with a picture of a vaguely familiar chef hanging on the wall. When the host escorted us to our booth, Mary and I scooted into the inside of the booth with Orion and Liam on either side. The waiter presented our menu, and my entire focus was absorbed by what to eat, a high priority to me regardless of the circumstances. After a few minutes, Liam leaned over to look at the menu. What do you think you'll get? I jerked my attention away from the list of pastas I was drooling over. Mary and Orion were looking at the wine menu together. I'm trying to decide. Everything looks really good. Chicken penne is my go-to Italian meal. But since we're at a fancy restaurant, maybe I should try something new, like the pumpkin ravioli. But then I see the appetizers and could make a whole meal out of the stuffed mushrooms, antipasta, bruschetta. But that would be so much food. You'd have to roll me out of here. If you want, we can order a couple of appetizers and split them instead of doing an entree. Then grab a dessert to split. Orion gestured at us with the wine menu. Do you two want to split a bottle of wine? They have a nice 2011 that I enjoy, but a bottle is a bit much for Mary and me. Mary raised an eyebrow at me. Di and I can only have a little glass. We shoot early tomorrow. I looked at Liam and nodded. Sure, Orion, that'd be great. He turned back to me. You can get your own entree, of course, but if you want the appetizers, I'd love to split. My cheeks warmed. Sharing food at a restaurant felt intimate. I shouldn't blush over something so simple. 
I was a 30-year-old woman. Technically, 31 years old, but no need to be picky. I'd love that. You sure you don't mind? Not at all. I had been dreaming about this date since Mary had pressured Orion and Liam into agreeing weeks earlier. I lifted a hand to feel my necklace, moving the clasp around the back. Liam had given it to me on my birthday, and I had only taken it off to shower. I had dreamed about this night, and now the butterflies in my stomach were overwhelming me. It was like I stood on the edge of a high dive and was about to jump off. After the waiter took our order and was pouring our wine, I started to rethink the decision to split food with Liam. I thought you hated splitting food. Didn't you tell me that whenever someone takes food off your plate, you consider stabbing them in the hand with a fork? He chuckled. I would never stab you in the hand. He raised his glass. Orion, do you want to propose a toast? We grabbed our glasses and raised them. Orion's eyes lingered on Mary, though she didn't notice as she smiled at me. To new adventures, both known and those that come upon us as a surprise. I slid out of the seat and accepted Liam's hand to rise. After I stood, he laced his fingers through mine and led me out of the restaurant. I was beyond full and felt light and breezy from the excellent red wine. Orion and Mary walked ahead of us, her arm tucked into the crook of his elbow. Where are we going now? Back to the casino? I asked Liam as we entered the bustling casino. Couples were everywhere, causing us to weave in and out as the crowd surged in various directions. We lost sight of Orion and Mary, but Liam didn't seem concerned. You'll see. Did you enjoy the meal? I did, thank you. I blushed as his thumb rubbed across my hand. It wasn't the first time he had grabbed my hand this weekend, but it was our first official date. Holding hands on a date seemed different. All of this felt different. Wonderful and new, but different. I must have dragged behind because Liam turned around. Are you okay? I rushed to assure him. Yes, I'm wonderful. I'm just taking in the moment. He smiled and pulled me forward. We have to hurry. You can take in the moment when we get there. We stepped outside, and the breeze that hit me was chilly with a bit of moisture. The air was thick with the smell of wet asphalt mixed with smog. After living in Wyoming for the winter, the smell was foreign. I had no idea how I had been able to breathe with so much pollution. Liam squeezed my hand as we raced down the sidewalk to an enormous man-made lake. Just as we reached the edge, the music boomed through the hidden speakers. We continued down the sidewalk until we found a small area with no other people. Small droplets of water danced down from the sky, barely enough to qualify as rain. I went to the railing to see the show, and Liam came up behind me. His body barely grazed mine, but the heat of him warmed me. I leaned back to talk over my shoulder, my back pressed into his chest. What a great idea! He ran his hands around my waist, pulling me in close. I enjoyed the loud bass thrumming through my whole body, but had no desire to focus on the show when I was this close to Liam. We had had a near kiss a few weeks earlier, and I wasn't about to let another opportunity slip by. I turned and lifted my chin so we faced each other. Thank you for the dinner, Liam. I'm having a nice time. He slid a hand up my back to my hairline, where his thumb played over the side of my neck. Slowly, he leaned down, and I stood on my toes to meet him halfway as my hands pushed to his chest. The second our lips touched, it was like a dam broke. My heart soared, and the tension I hadn't realized I was carrying was gone. My knees buckled, and my hand snaked around his neck to steady myself. He responded by pulling me closer, his lips tasting lightly of the fruity wine. He pulled back to look into my eyes as his fingers spread through the hair at the nape of my neck. I've wanted to do that since we met. He had his other arm wrapped around my waist, while his thumb on my neck sent tingles down my spine as it played over my skin. We were inches apart, my calves burning from standing up on my toes, but I couldn't bear to move any farther away. Since you saw me standing by a dead body, he leaned in a bit closer as he whispered, since you swooned into my arms. I wasn't swooning then. Oh, he leaned in, his lips barely brushed mine when Mary's voice broke the moment. Die, we have to go. 
I inhaled sharply. I'm busy. I'm sorry, but Loggins hurt. He was run over by a chariot, then caught on fire. No, I'm fine. The fire was small. Loggins' eyes were wild, far too much of the white showing, and his face was pale. I think you might be in shock, I said gently. I think you should go to a hospital. No, I'm not leaving this room. Orion, Liam, Mary, Moo, Minx, and I were huddled in the boys' room, where Loggin was sitting on the fold-out couch. Mink sat next to him, rubbing his back. The paramedics gave him a once-over before they took Lucky away. They wanted him to go to the hospital just in case, but Logan refused, and they didn't push it. He didn't hit his head, nothing appears to be broken, and the burn is very mild. We had left the water show as soon as Mary found out. She had no details beyond what she had already shared. Apparently, Minx had been crying too hard to say much more than that we needed to get back. Logan was looking around with wide eyes, a pillow clutched to his chest, with a baggie full of ice wrapped in a towel resting on his leg. Moo lay next to Logan, his paws across Logan's lap. He looked around the room, ready to attack anything that threatened Logan's safety. Minx's eyes were red, but she seemed to be in better control. Minx, what happened? Before the gala, they did the same thing they do every year give out some awards, have a speech from some celebrity that also shoots a bow, inductees to the Hall of Fame, and lastly, they present the archers that are still clean. It was in the arena. Afterwards, there's free food and a cash bar. Becca came and got Logan. Next thing I know, they dim the lights and a horse-drawn chariot comes out with flames shooting out of the back, with Lucky, then Unk, Fox, and Rue. Logan was in the last one. When Lucky's chariot turned, the wheels came off. He fell, then she sobbed and covered her mouth. Logan stared at the opposite wall with no emotion on his face. They ran right over him. Thump, thump. I didn't want to ride in a chariot at all. I tried to get out of it, but Big Bobby said if I didn't do it, I would be disqualified. Then I saw Lucky disappear under Unk's chariot. Minx hugged him. The horses stopped and more chariots tipped over. I thought Logan was run over. Then people started screaming that Logan was on fire. It was just my pant leg. The chariot driver helped me. I might have been hit by something. I I don't know. His face was getting wider as he trailed off. Mink stabbed at her eyes. Everything went crazy. They evacuated the tournament. They covered Lucky up. He didn't make it. I think we need to go. Logan and Minx need to sleep this off. They must be canceling the tournament now. Liam stood up and headed toward the door. I'll make some phone calls. There was no chance that this was an accident. Not after the way things had gone this whole weekend. Was anyone else hurt? Minx shook her head. I don't know. I had Moo with me and we were standing on the top level. Security forced me out of there as soon as the accident happened. That's when I called you. I was freaking out about Logan. Then I remembered the elevator security had told Di about. No one was guarding that exit. I found Logan. He reached out for her hand and squeezed it. They tried to make me leave, but Logan refused, so they had to let him go. We've been here ever since. What took you guys so long? She snapped at me, her frustration and fear finally finding a place to land. We got here as soon as we could. It's Valentine's Day on the Strip. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. She sniffled and dabbed at her nose with a crumpled tissue. I know. I patted her knee. Her bark and her bite were intense, but she was pretty scared right now. Mary was unusually quiet, her eyebrows all knit up as she quietly observed. The tournament's still on, Liam announced as he entered the room. Are you serious? He nodded. I talked to my mom. She was at the meeting as one of the major sponsors. The tournament board was also there, and they voted to continue. Bobby recommended against it, along with most of the sponsors, but the archers on the board insisted and said the rest of the divisions agreed. It was a pretty heated meeting, but the tournament can only be canceled by... I finished his sentence for him. A two-thirds vote by the tournament committee. If the tournament is canceled before the shoot-off, then no shoot-off amounts are paid out but only the non-shoot-off payouts are given, which are much lower. The same thing happens if there's no shoot-off. Liam raised an eyebrow. We read the rules last night. 
A much bigger point is that if they cancel the tournament, then something similar happens to the payouts across the board in every single division, not just the huge payout in the pro male compound. I'm sure a lot of archers were pushing to continue the tournament. Logan, you have to pull out. This is way out of control. If you had been in that first chariot, Mink stood up and pointed a finger at me. Shut up. Don't say it. Tears streaming down her face. It's okay, Minx. It's okay. He wasn't. He's safe. Things were rapidly getting out of control. Mary, can you take Minx back to her room? I'll take Moo on a walk. Then we can all go to bed. Mary nodded. Good idea. Come on, Minx. I'll tuck you in and everything. If you need us, she cast the comment to the entire room. Just call. I pulled Moo off of Logan's lap and Liam followed me. I'll go with you he said as he grabbed a key card off the dresser and followed me to the hallway. We saw Mary and Minx into our room, then continued down to the elevator. Mom's pretty disgusted. Liam stepped into an elevator and pushed the button for the lobby. People were screaming and threatening to sue the organization and Bobby personally for their expenses if the tournament was canceled. Bobby tried to convince them that everyone's safety was more important than any tournament, but no one would listen. I shook my head in disgust as we exited the elevator. There was a pet area near the elevator, and Liam pushed the door open for us to step through. It's just a tournament, and already two people have died. Ankh was apparently one of the loudest. Mom said that she thought he was about to leap the table and punch Bobby across the face. He's in the shoot-off. He has $100,000 to lose. That's a lot of money. Men have been known to kill for less. Moo sniffed a bush and claimed it as his. Liam held the door open for me. This isn't quite how I thought tonight would go. I stifled a yawn. I'd say it was pretty awesome for the most part, if you ignore Logan almost getting flattened. A few archers crowded into the elevator with us, complaining about the rumor they heard about canceling the tournament. Liam and I held hands in silence on the way up, though Moo insisted on standing between us. Stepping out of the elevator... Liam gave the men a nod. Good evening. As we approached our door, passing groups of people huddled in the hallway. I could have kicked myself for not considering that Liam and I weren't going to have a private moment to say goodnight. Why hadn't I thought of that when we were alone outside? When I got to the door, I poked my head inside to see if maybe we could sneak in there, but Mary was in her pajamas already. I flipped the lock and turned back to Liam. He wrapped me in a hug, his lips brushing my forehead. I'll try to come over and watch you shoot in the morning, but Mom wants to meet me for breakfast. Sleep well. There was more I wanted to say, but it would need to wait. Stepping into the room, I closed and locked the door, then tore off my shoe. Mary waved me over to the computer. I want to show you this. Remember Indy saying they were filming the tournament? They filmed the thing tonight, too. I gasped. They didn't film Lucky being killed, did they? That's not right. No, no. Here, watch. Mary pressed a few buttons and the screen popped up. The chariots were barely visible in the dark arena. I skipped over the other stuff. The first chariot, carrying Lucky, rolled out. Lucky waved to the crowd while the handler snapped the reins on the horse's rump. My heart twisted in my chest, knowing that this was the last image of him alive. Following behind him was a second chariot, then a third, a fourth, And lastly, the fifth chariot came out from behind the curtain into the arena, carrying Logan. Lucky's chariot had just disappeared from the left side of the screen when the crowd, as one, gasped and cried out. A second later, the arena was obscured as people stood, blocking the camera, but the screams were still audible until the video stopped. Mary moved the mouse to rewind the video. There's only a few seconds, but look at the wheels on the chariot. She hit play and pointed to the wheels as they popped off. The left wheel fell off on every single one, like someone went down the line and loosened them. I figured it wasn't an accident. Can we see who is behind the curtain? Good idea. She scrolled around in the video. A number of people could be seen behind the curtain. All the shooters that were clean, Lucky, Unk, Fox, Rue, and Logan. Tournament staff, judges, Big Bobby, and Becca, along with two dozen sponsors and archers. Basically anyone? Let's make a list. That's what we normally do. Mary flipped open her notebook. I'm putting Unk, 
Fox, and Rue at the top of the list. They have the most to gain. Lucky could have done it and made a miscalculation, I pointed out. If that's the case, then he's already paid for his crimes. Next, Pinky and the rest of the angry female compound shooters that protested. We haven't heard anything since Westmount announced the additional prize money. If they were behind it, then wouldn't they still be angry and protesting? Mary pointed her pencil at me. You may not have heard about it, but I heard plenty. Pinky came over to complain after she was done fighting with Lucky and Katie. Speaking of which, what if Lucky dying had a two-for-one motive? Not only was he a pro male, but he also cheated on Pinky. Oh, Mary, I didn't even think of that. Put Pinky at the top of the list. We can sniff around some more tomorrow. Who else? Anything tie the remaining shooters together? Like, could a company have eliminated the competition so their people would win? She shook her head. No, all different bow companies, arrows, etc. They aren't friends or anything. Who else benefits? Maybe the tournament organization wants it canceled so they can keep the shoot-off money? Who would that be? Becca, Big Bobby, and who? Just the two of them. The rest of the decisions are made by the board that's elected into office. They're spread all over the country. I'm putting Becca and Bobby in the list. Remind me to ask Liam if they get back the money if the shoot-off is canceled. Ankh is on the board and in the shoot-off. Maybe he has a plan to use the money to his advantage either way. I don't think Ankh would do that. Don't let yourself be influenced by a flirty smile. She gruffed at me, but underlined Unk's name in her notebook while covering her mouth with the other hand. My bed started to creak under Moo's weight as he ran after invisible rabbits in his sleep. I think I'm about to fall asleep standing up. After we're done shooting tomorrow, we can focus 100% on catching the killer. Deal? Mary grabbed the financial sheet I had stolen and stuffed it into the notebook, then shoved both into her backpack. Deal. Chapter 8 I scanned the crowd looking for Liam. Di, will you stop that and focus? We only have one end left. Mary had her arms crossed and wore her sternest expression. We had forgotten to set our alarm for this morning. I had rolled over to check my phone only to realize that it was the time we had planned to leave for breakfast and we were still in bed. The rest of the morning was a race to get ready and get to the shooting venue on time. Orion had taken care of Moo and gotten each of us a breakfast sandwich, but both Mary and I were a bit testy. Moo pressed his head into my hand and some of my frustration melted away. His brown eyes looked up at me, and if I leaned down a little, we could touch noses. As I got close, his pink tongue whipped out and caught me across the lips. Ooh, Moo, gross. I dragged the back of my arm across my face to remove errant doggy germs. Mary giggled, sounding less cranky and more like her jovial self. Yeah, Moo, there's only one guy she wants the tongue from. Mary, shh. I looked around, hoping no one had heard her teasing, but everyone was happily absorbed in their own activities. I need to talk to Liam about that. You are not getting cold feet now, are you? You two are perf- I cut her off and leaned in close. No, of course not. I'm crazy about him. But my divorce is so close to being finalized, and since we work together, I don't need everyone watching our every move. I want it to be just him and me for a while. She shrugged. Everyone knows, but whatever, as long as I still get all the good gossip. Come on, we're up. This was not only the last end of my tournament, but also of Mary Minx and me, Logan's angels, who were either doing an awful job at protecting Logan since he kept having near misses, or a great job since he was still alive. Orion had left him sleeping in the room this morning. I had slept fitfully the night before. Far too much had happened for me to slip into an easy sleep. As I grabbed my bow and got to the line, the same thought that had run through my mind last night assaulted me again. Did we need to tell Elizabeth about Liam and me since we were co-workers? Did Westmount have rules about co-workers dating? Would it be weird at work now? I did my best to stuff those thoughts away as the whistle blew to shoot my three arrows. I set my shoulders, 
took a deep, slow breath, and focused on smooth, consistent motion as I drew back the arrow. After I shot the last arrow, I stepped off the line and blew out a breath. It had been a few points lower than the other two days, but I had held it together. Now to solve two murders! Stripping off my equipment, I searched the crowd again, this time finding Liam. He stood next to Orion. The sight of him curled my toes and heated my face. I raced through the process of filling out and signing my card. I stepped away, then had to race back to thank the archers I had shot with and shake their hands, a basic courtesy that couldn't be ignored just because I was eager to get to Liam, my... Boyfriend? Man I kissed? There were a lot of things we needed to figure out. I grabbed my bow, bag, scorecards, and jacket and pushed through the crowd to Liam. Hi. He gave me a quick hug that I couldn't return with my arms full. I'm sorry, I couldn't get over here sooner. You did great. He took the bow and my quiver from me. If you want out of this madhouse, I can meet you after I turn in the scorecards. Liam tipped his head to the side at Orion. Sure, we'll take Moo to the pet area. You and Mary can meet us out there. I nodded and found Mary in the throng of people pushing to leave the shooting area as they fought against the next division of archers trying to get into the same space. She passed off her things to Orion, and I followed her to the scorecard turn-in line. Catching up with her as she stepped to the back of the line, I peeked over her shoulder to see how she had shot. Awesome, Mary. She smiled and looked at my scorecard. Not so bad yourself. How did Minx do? And have you seen Tiger? I rolled my eyes. Tiger is neck deep in pretty she-archers. I saw Minx but haven't spoken to her. She could have knocked on our door to make sure we are awake before they left this morning. We'll short sheet her bed when we get back to the center. Mary handed the tournament official her scorecards. Once we got back our copies of our scorecards to keep, we pushed through the long line of people. Mary stepped around a gaggle of kids and came to my side as we moved down the hallway to the pet area outside the tournament office. Who's shooting now? I asked. The pro division. I hear that Rue hopped on out of the competition. A guy on my target is friends with Rue's roommate. Rue separated his shoulder in the chariot fall. I didn't think anyone was hurt. He woke up in the middle of the night in pain. Maybe the shock wore off? And Fox's wife made them check out of the hotel last night. With Logan pulling out of the tournament, there will be no shoot-off. Shut up! I pushed the door open out onto the pet area. No shoot-off at all? You can't have a shoot-off with only one person. Does this mean that Logan's safe now? I guess so, if that was the motive. Hey, Liam, what will happen to the 30000 from Westmount? Liam stared at me blankly. What? Sorry, I kind of jumped into the middle of the conversation. The 30000 that Westmount donated to the Casino Cup to raise the payout for first place for the pro compound male winner of the shoot-off. If there's no shoot-off, then the shoot-off money isn't paid. Does the company get the money back or does the tournament keep it for future years? Liam looked at me, one eye quirked up, then looked at Orion, who shrugged. He looked back at me. 30,000? I looked at Mary, who seemed equally confused. Apparently, we were speaking two different languages. I wasn't sure which part was throwing him. Yes, 30,000. It was like 10,000 from Westmound, five from Anderson, or something like that, for 30 total. Why are you looking at me like that? He shook his head slowly, his brows furrowed. I have no idea what you're talking about. Mary, can you get that page for me? She dug out the page from her notebook and handed it to me, and I passed it to Liam. See, this is the money donated by companies to raise the shoot-off payout. Didn't you know about this? Goosebumps ran down my arms. Something was off. He looked over the page, then tilted it to Orion to see. Orion looked at it and shrugged his shoulders. Then Liam handed it back. Maybe this is a list of what they hoped we would donate, but that's not what happened. Where did you get that? A voice behind me said. I turned and saw Becca holding her e-cig. She let the door close behind her. I was caught off guard. I... 
I found it on the ground. She sighed and rolled her eyes. I should have shredded the trash myself. Don't tell Bobby you saw it, but I suppose you could have gotten that information from asking around. She didn't seem upset, instead taking a drag off her fake cigarette. These are the amounts that companies donated for the shoot-off payout? She nodded and took another puff. Liam looked between us. No, it isn't. We didn't donate that much. Becca gave him a funny look. Yes, you did. I saw the check. I wrote the check. It was for 3000 She fidgeted with her pen. A thin layer of professionalism was trying to cover her growing frustration. The first check was for 3000 Then a few days later, another check came. We only sent one check. Right, Orion? Orion nodded. Becca seemed to lose some of her confidence. But I saw the check. I saw all the checks. I stamped the back so Bobby could deposit them. Does he normally deposit the checks? I pushed her. This was the weak link to the mystery, though I had no clue what any of this meant. Becca stared off into the distance. No, they came on Thursday. That's my salsa night, and I leave early. In fact, a lot of checks came on Thursdays. Her hand shook slightly as she took a puff. Why would Bobby lie about getting the money? Was he stealing money? She turned to me with wide eyes. I don't know, but something's way off. I tried to figure out what it meant. Mary threw her backpack over her shoulder. There's no shoot-off money. Come on, we need to tell someone. Becca, stay with us. We strode into the hallway and ran into Minx, who was crying as she raced by. What are you guys doing? Mary hooked an arm through hers. We think we solved the mystery. Bobby had some scam to keep the shoot-off from happening. Minx stopped. But nothing's been decided yet. There still could be a shoot-off. No, Lucky's gone. Fox and Rue pulled out, so even if Unk shoots clean right now, there'll be no shoot-off. The rules require a minimum of two archers with a score of 900 to have a shoot-off. Login shooting. He took off with Unk after we fought. My jaw dropped. He what? Mink started crying. He came to get me and asked me on a date instead of shooting. And I said I didn't think of him that way. Then Unk started yelling at him that he had to shoot. Otherwise, Unk couldn't win the shoot off unless Logan shot and shot clean. Then I yelled at Logan not to do it. And he said I couldn't. She hiccuped and sobbed. If Logan was going to shoot, then he was at risk. I can't get into your mess of a love life right now, Minx. Logan is in danger. Where did he go? We have to warn him. Minx went pale. I don't know. Bobby told Unk and Logan that he had a room for them to wait in. Where? Minx shrugged. I, I don't know. They went off that way. Becca started. I know. There's a room down by the arena. She started jogging down the hall and I fell in close behind her. She barked ahead. Move out of the way, people. Move it. The crowd surged out of her way, then closed behind us. I grabbed Mary's hand and pulled her in close to me, but the rest of the group was cut off. Becca cut through a door and down a staircase I hadn't seen. Bobby had said that we should have all the archers that shot clean the first two days make a big entrance on day three, but he canceled this morning when he heard there was no shoot-off. This way. The hallway we ran down was dank and cold with its cement floor and cinder block walls. Becca screeched to a stop in front of a nondescript door. She grabbed the handle and tried to turn the knob. Locked. I banged on the door. Login. Open the door. Login. My palms were slick. I left wet handprints on the door. Becca shoved me out of the way. I have a key. She unlocked the door and kicked it open. The door crashed into the wall with the force. Hot, wet air rolled out of the room, a gas heater going full blast in the far corner. Unk and Logan were collapsed on the floor, their bows and arrows spread across the ground. I screamed, help, help, security. Mary pointed, we have to get them out. Hold your breath. Becca was yelling for help as she ran down the hallway. Mary and I held our breath as we raced in and grabbed Logan by the feet and dragged him to the hallway. 
I was getting lightheaded from the effort to get him clear of the doorway when men shoved us out of the way and went into the room. Liam caught me under the arms and pulled me away. It's okay. Loggin and Unk are okay. He lifted me under the legs and carried me out into the arena. I've got you. Liam and I were gathered around Loggin's hospital bed later that night. I felt a bit nauseated from the carbon monoxide that had been in the room. The gas heater would have easily killed Unk and Loggin if they had been left in there much longer. Orion had carried Mary out right after Liam got me out. Liam and Orion insisted that Mary and I get checked out at the hospital, and once we were cleared, Liam and I had found Logan while Orion and Mary checked on Unk. Moo was with Jess and Minx back at the casino. Logan shifted in his bed and adjusted the backup higher. I don't understand why Big Bobby tried to kill me. I shook my head. Money. He had announced that there would be a $100,000 payout six months ago and figured he could get sponsors to cover it. They didn't. Liam sat on a small couch under a window. I double-checked with some friends at other companies and compared it with the numbers Big Bobby had reported to the office. He had only raised an extra $8,000. I nodded along. I talked to Jess, and she shared some dirt with me. The casino had figured that someone was trying to rig how many guys made it into the shoot-off. Big Bobby had taken the extra money and placed a bet that five or fewer guys would make it into the shoot-off. It paid 10 to 1. So that would have covered the 75,000 he was raising above the standard 25,000 payout every other year. That's why your friend's drinks were doped. The van almost ran you over. The fire alarm went off. All that was to rattle you guys so you drop points and the shoot off would have so few men that he won the bet. Mary and I had run my cell phone batteries almost dead, gathering facts and confirming suspicions all afternoon while we waited in the hospital. Logan scrubbed his face. But Mike Champ was killed, and so was Lucky. We think Mike Champ was an accident, that Big Bobby only meant to scare them, but Mike got one of the dope drinks and fell in front of the van. Lucky is a different story. After the casino pulled all the gambling, Big Bobby was desperate. There was no way to get the money he needed, so he had to make sure the shoot-off was canceled completely by making sure no more than one person shot clean. If that happened, he didn't have to pay out the 100000 that he didn't have. He loosened the hub on the chariots, hoping that you guys either got hurt or scared enough not to shoot clean. Then he tried to get the committee to call off the tournament. But you and Unk insisted on shooting, even though you promised you wouldn't. I glared at him, mad all over again that he had broken his word. Logan stared ahead at the opposite wall. Liam caught my eye and shook his head. I continued. So Big Bobby put you in the room to wait and cranked up the gas heater that had a huge warning sign on the side not to use in enclosed spaces. It filled the room with carbon monoxide. I threw myself onto him and hugged him tight. You big idiot. You could have died. He patted my back. Ah, die. I had you and Mary to protect me. You were my angels. I stood up and wiped away a tear. We're a family, all of us. Liam got up and put an arm around my shoulder. Try to stay out of danger in the future, Logan. You'd be tough to replace. Logan blushed. He looked exhausted and pale. One last thing. Why didn't Big Bobby just say that he didn't have the money? Mary spoke from the doorway. He couldn't. He had everything riding on this tournament. I turned to look at her and Orion as they joined us. What? Mary patted Logan's hand. Unk spilled the beans that Big Bobby had everything hinged on this tournament. The board had tried to replace him two years ago, but Big Bobby convinced them that he should stay because he had big plans for this year. They agreed based on him being able to pull it off. If he had said he hadn't gotten the money after all, they were going to fire him. So he killed two people and almost killed two more for a job? Logan laid his head back on his pillow. Mary shook her head. It was his whole world. All of his pride, meaning, and social circle were connected to the job that he had had for decades. I don't think he planned on killing anyone, but after Mike Champ died, there was no turning back. How are you feeling, Logan? Liam grabbed my arm and pulled me to the door. Hey, Logan, sleep well. 
Mary, Orion, we'll wait for you in the hall. The hallway was empty. We walked to the elevators where two chairs were arranged. Liam sat next to me and held my hand. You said that next time you would find me instead of running away? I know. I'm sorry. He squeezed my hand, not realizing how hard he was already holding it. Can I ask for a favor? I didn't want to have this conversation, but I needed to ask. Sure. Can we not tell anyone about us? Us? Why? I don't like the idea of everyone watching. Are you dating anyone else? I shook my head. No. Do you want to? Definitely not. A small smile played across his face, and he gave me a quick kiss as footsteps came down the hall. Good enough for now. The end. This has been Death in the Casino. Target Practice Mysteries 5. Written by Nikki Haverstock. Narrated by the author. For more information about Nikki Haverstock and her work, please visit NikkiHaverstock.com.